Oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. Oh, please let it be for me. You never heard that? Four Plebs, right? Barstool Sports brought to you by our lovely American company friends at Chevy. We love Chevy, Chevy Silverado. Go check that puppy out. Chevy Silverado EV. Great truck, valuable truck, Barstool Sports, Chevy, the whole deal. It's a sad day. It's a sad day on the Four Play podcast. Mm. Um, you know, we're going to, we we're incapable of doing a podcast, not at the normal scheduling time and not talking about it. So we have to talk about it. So we're recording <laughs> on Saturday, which is the day after the New York Islanders have been eliminated in horrific fashion. I know that's top of mind for, uh, really probably everyone on the show because it's top of mind for someone on the show so much that, um, it's just a sad day, it's a sad day in the four play universe. Um, I was rooting for the Islanders big time. And uh, you just hated to see it go down that way, Frankie. It's fucking devastating. There's really no other way to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> it's a devastating day. It's been devastating for 29 years of my life. Um, I live and die with this team. And the highs and the lows. The highs are high, even though it's round one. And the lows are real low, like real dark low. Last night was a weird, weird dark night at, uh, leaving UBS. Throughout a lot of the season, I really felt like there was no chance this year. A lot of injuries. They didn't play well. They went on like crazy losing streaks. They were out of the playoffs for 70 to 80% of the season, it felt like. And then all of a sudden, they just like surge back and, you know, they get Bo Horvat and like the island, the island is rocking and they make the playoffs in game 82. And it's just like, wow, things are happening. Carolina has a bunch of injuries. You're like, this is a perfect setup for the Islanders. They, they avoided the Bruins which in hindsight, we'll see what happens with that, but they're going to game seven. But, um, And it's just like they, they outplayed Carolina for a lot of the games. Game two, they blew a lead late in the third. A puck was off fucking Sorokin's head, missed a high sticking call, and then they fucking lose in overtime. They lose in overtime in game six. It's one of those series where it's like it could have went either way, and that's really frustrating. Last night, the Islanders fucking dominated for 40 minutes. I don't know if you guys watched, but they fucking – I watched the whole fucking, game. Same. They were – they were controlling that game, and they just couldn't get more than one goal. And when it went to the third up one nothing, I said, this is a classic case of you wish you got more than one. Like, Carolina is on the road in a game that they want to close out, and they're in the, the locker room in between the second and third being like, we survived. Like, we survived the push, and, like, we just need to get one, and it's ours. And that's what happened. I mean, Sorokin made 39 saves. Everyone's going to talk about the last one. The last one's a shit fucking goal. But if it wasn't that one, it was another one. Like he made some outrageous saves in the third period that was like, you should have lost the game 3 1 at that point. Um, yeah, it's really fucking tough. I love this team and uh, I love this like squad. And I don't know if this is like the last hoorah for a couple of the guys. Yeah, who's who's up contract wise? Is there anyone? It's a lot of guys. Like Scotty Mayfield's a free agent and fucking like, you know, Clutterbuck's coming down the last years of his deal and, ba- and Bailey was getting scratched. It's just like the, that core. We might see a different co- like team next year, whether that's good or bad. I don't know. Um, Zach Parise might like hang it up. They said that he was like staring at his skates. He wouldn't take his skates off all night, like in his lot in the locker room. Guy played like over a thousand games in the NHL. It's fucking awesome. The fact that how much he cares about this team. So yeah, sad fucking shit, man. Sad shit. You could take a little solace in the fact that uh, the New York Rangers are on the brink of elimination. So that's, I imagine you've shifted we'll your see. focus. This show's yeah. coming out Tuesday. It's tough. It it's tough be. to talk I'm about not. games that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, like it the Bruins. Be. If the Rangers could. lose, all is good for me. It's just another right. year that, like, we didn't win, mm-hmm. which is the same that's been for me for 30 years, the same that's been for the Rangers for, like, 86 out of the last 87 years. So we'll see what happens. I think the devil should be able to pull it off. This is probably going to be played back for people where the, the, the Rangers <laughs> just completely just ramshack the devils <laughs> in two games and they go on to win the Stanley Cup. But if that happens, I win $26,000 in the Barcelona Sportsbook, so that's fine. Uh, so, yeah, so people, folks know we're, uh, we talk a lot about the travel. We got Barstool Classic and Palm Springs on Monday. We've got the uh, USGA trip coming up for uh, Jonesy and Alex Bush. They're going to do basically um, U.S. Open and U.S. Women's Open Media Day at LACC Monday, Pebble Beach on Tuesday. They're going to be out there capturing all kinds of stuff, drone footage, hole by hole, all kinds of cool stuff that we're going to release. The women are playing the U.S. Open at 
Pebble Beach for the first time. I believe that's never happened before. So um, so those guys are flying out Sunday. They're filming and, and playing the courses, and they're going to come on the show next week and the weeks around the U.S. Open weeks and talk all about that experience. Um, the three of us, me, Frankie, Trent, have, as we've rubbed in everybody's fucking faces, been able to play Pebble Beach, Dad Bod Classic, Josh Isner, the whole deal. So we figured this opportunity, send those guys. They're the ones that are capturing stuff anyways, and they've come such a long way and are absolute professionals at it. So anyways, they've got a huge week coming up. So the reason we're recording Saturday beforehand, um, it's not like this is a huge week. It's the Mexico Open. Something crazy happens. We can obviously record a little bit on Monday and toss that into the show. Um, and then we've also got this week, I know Dan Rabaport's feeling under the weather, so we're going to get a quick update because you are debuting a new video series uh, called Sidekick. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I'm really excited. In some ways, this is like, it's going to sound very cheesy, but it's kind of like the summation of my career thus far. Like I've okay. never, you know, this is the biggest project that I've done before. Yeah. Um, the the concept if if people aren't familiar is is basically you know it's kind of been a white whale for me always it's like you you, know, you can interview guys at, at golf tournaments and and it's fun and it's cool you know you do it at the press conference you can interview guys on the podcast but I've always wanted to get like inside and be like out there with them for a couple hours just shooting the shit because when you get on a golf course you, you open up you know that's just how golf works it's their comfort zone this is what they do and these guys you know a lot of times when they're when they're in the media you know after around they're get, people are looking for for quotes people are looking for for headlines but this is just a free flowing conversation so i went down to houston a couple of weeks ago with Saif, uh thigala who did us a real solid by playing unbelievable at the masters and yeah. then finishing i think he was like third or fourth at the rbc heritage so Saif's up to number 22 in the world um he's got a certain swagger and a certain uh, energy he's 22 in just, the world Holy yeah, he's cow. 22 in the world. Yeah, he's he's, he's moving just, up. Oh, he's a star. Yeah. And um, so we we I caddied for him uh, in, a, in a friendly match against one of his buddies who's a, a mini tour pro who actually played in the U.S. Open at Torrey Pines, qualified. Um, and, you know, Soth and I go go pretty far back. So it's, it's you know, it's it's sort of an interview, but it's also a lot of the, the caddy X's and O's conversations that people seem to love on social media. We get really nitty gritty into, you know, I'm trying to hold an eight against this win that, you know, I don't want to miss right at this pin, but it, I feel like it's going to skid that kind of stuff. But also we talk about, you know, his parents and their arranged marriage and his siblings and, you know, move, you know dealing with money. And ha- it's a it's it's a dream project of mine. And I'm really, really excited for everyone to see it. Um, we're going to do a few more this year, so I'm sure we're going to learn from this one as far as camera angles, as far as how it was shot. Um, but really, really excited to hit the ground running, and I really hope you guys all check it out. Super wow. exciting. Just new yeah, series is. is just great for our viewership, our fans, people that want to watch us doing different shit. <clears throat> it's great. I mean, we're just attacking, we're attacking every angle of the game of golf. You can go on our YouTube page and watch us play matches. You can watch us do obstacle courses. You can watch us break down guys like – history and their families and you can do caddy angles it's fucking we're hitting it from every single angle i think this week is a good example of sort of what we're doing um you guys are all doing your thing the the boys are going to play pebble beach and lacc i'm going to uh, charlotte for quail hollow you know to do my journalism thing we're just we're hitting it from all angles and um I'm really, really excited. So yeah. this side gig is going to be on uh, YouTube, what, Wednesday night, Push? What are, we got yeah, a Wednesday scheduling night. situation here? Wednesday night. All right, Wednesday night. I uh, imagine we'll go 7 p.m. Uh, side gig, Dan Rappaport, saw Hithagala, who he's a star, full swing, made him a star. He's playing great. I looked, he's ranked uh, ahead of Tommy Fleetwood, Billy Horschel, Jason Day, Justin Rose. He's ranked higher in the world than all those guys. So he's playing he's some good. fucking golf. I thought that episode in full swing when he was at the Phoenix Open and they were cutting to like his dad who was all like rooting for him and then devastated when he had a couple bad holes down the stretch. That vaulted him into uh, big time stardom. We've had him on the show a few times. And then for you to go down there and do that, it's going to be I'm very, very excited to watch. So, uh, nice. so yeah, people will be ready for that Wednesday. Um all right, Dan. Do you want to duck out? Are you sick? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm. Get your I sick ass wanted, out of I here. I also, well, I also wanted to say this is that this is a turning point, and I want to be held accountable with my health and my like. I've been getting okay. sick way too often. I've been getting. I've been treating my body like shit. Traveling, chewing tobacco, smoking, all of this shit. My body <laughs> is tapping out, and I'm I'm 28 years old. I'm too young to be like deathly sick. I think it's I think I've been sick like three like really sick three times this year, which is and not COVID, which is just not okay. So I'm um it's, it's almost like my body's te- it's my body's teaching me a lesson. Yeah, the first wake up call was you guys talking about Tony Gwynn, and then this <laughs> things are things are gonna change. All right, Dan. All right, that's the guy Saturday morning. That's the guy struggling on a Saturday morning. That's what, <laughs> that's you know, that's just what you get with that.
You know, we have been a part of the Chevy EV family. We got big news, and that is that the first ever all-electric Silverado EV is out. It's officially Barstool's most valuable truck. We got the chance to see it. We had a cool little commercial. We were in like a warehouse garage. We saw the orange one, the blue one, the white one, all kinds of cool ones. This is a uh, this is a modern marvel, this thing, I would say. It truly is. It's... Um... It's an amazing piece of technology, the infotainment system on the inside, mm, how quiet mm-hmm. it is, how just sleek it is, and it's a monster. It's a monster truck, but somehow it just it just just it just moves like the like the silence of the night. I really can't I'm, I can't believe that how they figured it out. It is incredibly quiet. They got uh, available 400 mile range over 10 feet of length in the bed with the multi-flex tailgate combined with the multi-flex midgate large 17 inch diagonal display infotainment system screen it can tow up to 10,000 pounds of max towing zero to 60 in under 4.5 seconds with wow mode up to an impressive 785 foot pounds of torque so this thing's just awesome it's incredible machine it's ev it's the silverado from chevy so go on over to chevy.com to learn more you're going to love the website. You're going to love playing with the different vehicles and the options they got. You're going to be blown away at all the lines of Chevy and all the brands that you've come to know and love that got them in the EV models. So go on over to Chevy.com to learn more. That's, I don't know if we've ever done this show on a Saturday. What do you mm-hmm. guys normally do on a Saturday? What's your Saturday, Saturday right now? Dude, it's Saturday right now. It's it Sunday. People I are going to be like, why, too. you know, but we just don't ever do a show on Saturday. So I'm kind of, I want to look inside. It's rainy. Of a, of a, it's so rainy here on Long Island. But what do you guys normally do on a Saturday? You know, f- if I don't have golf scheduled, which when I live out here, I usually don't because the courses are so jammed up. And if you don't schedule something way in advance. So I'll kind of mosey around. I went and got a coffee this morning, walked and got a coffee. I'll do a little bit of stuff around the place. I don't know, fucking clean stuff up, do laundry or something. In the afternoon, I'll probably saunter up over to Greyhawk. Maybe get a beer, maybe hit a couple balls, maybe play nine holes with some of the staff up there, um, and then usually take it relatively easy. And the reason I take it relatively easy, I think, is because Thursday and Friday, you just go so hard. You're just yeah. so excited. You're so <laughs> excited to get there, and I just can't do like three or four days in a row like you used to be able to do when you're younger, when you're in your 20s or something. So it's like Thursday night because with us, we front load our week. We do classics. We re- record the podcast usually Monday, Wednesday. We film videos. By Thursday night, you're like ready to go. And then they just go too hard. You kind of recover, but it's still Friday. People are excited. So you go Friday. Usually Saturday, I kind of chill at this point. Yeah. I, usually Saturday for me is like a get stuff around the house done day. Um, get stuff done around the house day. Um, mm-hmm. We'll go to like Lowe's. I'll take the lady to Lowe's and we'll go to like Hobby Lobby. I enjoy that shit. I talked about that a couple of shows ago. Like I enjoy like looking forward to the weekend and like adding things to the house or I'll go to like Best Buy, see if I can get some new technology. We just redid the front uh, of the house with all the landscaping. So like just looking at that shit and like making sure everything looks good. And what can we order? Can we order like low voltage lighting and start lighting up some of these some of these plants? I'm just a bunch of boring fucking old man shit. Um, And then I always have like something planned with friends like tonight we got some people coming over just to have wine and watch the rangers hopefully they lose and you know the <laughs> weekends are fun because our schedule is so crazy when we're not when we're not traveling almost every day feels like a weekend because we're able to kind of be totally. home and do whatever we want yeah but i really enjoy like when the nine to fivers and, and the people who are actually doing real jobs when they have the weekend off and it's like now we all can be excited about friday night saturday because they don't have to do anything tomorrow. It's always like, I, I would love to do stuff on Sunday. And they're like, we have work tomorrow. I'm like, oh, like I'm not traveling till Tuesday. I would love to do something tonight. And they're like, no, Saturday's our night. Saturday's the night to do it. So yeah, I'm excited. Tonight should be a fun night. The dirty little secret about getting older is that the trips to Lowe's and the trips to Target, those end up being pretty fun. Like, when oh. you're young, you're just like, dude, I'm going to drink Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and probably Sunday. That's just mm-hmm. what I'm going to do in my 20s. And you look at the people who are like, as you're on your way to the bar, you see people pulling into Lowe's and you're like, what's, what's that guy's life even like? And then you get older and you, it's like you become interested in doing those things. And it's actually good to like uh, fix up the house or like I clean up my apartment, I get everything organized. And it's so when we do travel, I come back to a clean apartment. It sounds so lame. If you're in your 20s right now, they're like, these guys are 55 years old and they yeah. need to like get a real life. But you end up maturing into like, I kind of like going to Lowe's and looking at those flower pots. Dude, I can't tell you how sick Target is. Target is awesome. (laughs) Like that place 
Will you walk around there, dude? Did you go from one section to the next? Like you go to the home decor section and you just see a couple things and you're like, that's going to make my place look kind of nice. And then you can just walk from that section two aisles over and they have like TVs and fucking like sound bars and shit. And you're like, oh, that'll make my setup nicer. And yeah, you end up spending hundreds of dollars you didn't plan on spending. But if you just go to Target with no plan, like no real game plan even, you come out of there with some great stuff. And then it inspires you to keep your place clean. You go back, you sort of move stuff around, you're making it look nice. And then I don't know if you guys do this. We do like we talk about how much we travel. I like to come back to a clean place, like you're saying. So I like to make my bed. I like to like even try to wash the sheets, scrub stuff down a little bit so that when I do return that moment and we're so all over the place, it might be a fucking Tuesday and it might feel like a Friday where it's like, dude, from this Tuesday that we just got back from a long trip till next Monday, I don't have to fly anywhere. I basically am on vacation for five days. Like we'll do our podcast and our bullshit, but like it feels like you're on vacation for five days when we're just home. Mm -hmm. Agree. It's awesome. And I'm I'm like really in the in the thick of <clears throat> all this decorating stuff. We're opening up that new bar in Long Beach, the Burley's Tap Room, and I really mm-hmm. have enjoyed like designing that because I I love having a clean slate. I had a clean slate with the house. I had a clean slate with the bar, and like seeing like your idea come to life is one of the coolest things you can do in this life. I think, like regardless of what it is, whether you're painting, you're drawing, you're designing a house, you're designing a room, you're just like doing a renovation, a restoration. Like being able to like see something and then do it is fucking awesome. And like you have all these crazy ideas. I'm like, I want these vines on the wall, and I want to like. T- I I went to Lowe's yesterday. And I got these like bistro lighting. I'm like, wouldn't that look cool over like the new pizza oven? And like we're putting it up, and we're like, whole like it's like an aha moment. You're like, holy shit, look at that. That looks unbelievable. And you know that like people are gonna come into the place and be like, that place is cool. And it all came from my brain. Like that's that's such a cool feeling of like designing something that people are gonna be like inside of it's very strange but a cool thing um that's yeah, awesome I'm, yeah it's yeah, fucking dude, it's, it's so cool imagine what a golf course architect must feel like like if they if you design something and you go through all this grind and you move all this dirt you put and then like years later you just see people out there loving and appreciating and playing this great game on your golf course that you design. That's oh my like, god i can't be, even imagine all the I mean, shots like did funneling it, off the green yeah. like all the shots funneling off the green into a collection area, like that's why we put that there. Or <laughs> like right. a mound pushing balls off, like not getting onto the green if they don't have the right club. Like legitimately moving dirt to affect a guy's day is so cool. If I were to design a <laughs> golf course, I would – and then put it into like pr- or like where people can play it. I would be worried that I would have made one glaring mistake mm-hmm. and people would be out there shooting 63s. And I'd be like, why – why is this happening? Those guys put a ton of work into it. And once people are playing it, that's got to be a crazy feeling. You just put all the fairway bunkers like 30 yards, not far enough. So everyone just hits it past them. And you're right. Course or people are shooting like even guys who are like one, two <laughs> scratch or shooting 93s. And you're like, I fucked something up. Oh, bad. Shit. Here. I don't know what it is, but I fucking blew it. God damn it. Um, I got to give a shout out. So we went to uh, we were in San Diego on Thursday for the Barstool Classic incredible scene everybody was pumped that it was a classic san diego day where it was fucking overcast in the morning shit cold for like an hour and a half and then by the hour and a half into the day it was like 70 sunny bluebird day it's also a thursday event you notice a huge difference like the monday the monday events that we do there's actually more almost excitement in the morning because you could tell people were hyped up and then as you get through the day yeah people start drinking a little bit more and there's obviously excitement hype and people are having a great time but you could tell the scary start to kick in a little bit from people being like, this was this three day weekend that I was excited for. I took Monday off work and like uh, the classics pretty much over. I'm about to like come crashing down. I got work in the morning, whatever. Similar with like Tuesday events. Thursday event is the beginning for a lot of people like we just talked about. So that Thursday afternoon at the San Diego stop at Madera's, which is a phenomenal spot. The whoop was high. People were people were buzzing. We ended up doing the putting contest. These poor guys were lights out and then horrible. And it was just a two-man race at the end. So we ended up just doing a boat race to decide who won the putting contest. So each guy just picked three guys because neither one of them were big drinkers. Each guy just picked three guys, and then they just did a truly boat race to see who ended up winning the whole thing. So the excitement level was incredibly high. It was an awesome crew. Everybody had a fantastic time. Um, and then I got to give a shout out. We on the show, we like to attack or shit on 
airline service when you get back, whatever. I got to give a shout out to there is a fantastic old Asian lady server at the Southwest Terminal in the San Diego airport. And the, the San Diego Southwest Terminal is, by all intents and purposes, not a place that anybody wants to be. It's like a circular, one of those circular terminals with like six gates and then not much to be like writing home about in the middle. It's kind of like a Hudson News thing and like a little pizza joint and then a small, tight bar. And the bar is a scene because you got the Southwest crowd. And again, everybody's packed in like fucking sardines, kind of miserable. And in that environment, you got to be on it to have a chance. Otherwise, you're trying to wait for your tab. You're going to miss your flight. People were in and out, whatever. This lady was one of the great servers of all time. I was sitting there every time she would, a new person would walk up. She'd be like, can I get you a drink? What would you like? Bang, hit them with their tab as soon as she brought the drink to the point where after about 30 minutes, every person that showed up, I was like, you got to order something from this server. She's fucking phenomenal. And she was just on it. And I know there's so many people that listen to this show that travel like we do that this Southwest terminal at the San Diego International Airport, you're going to know who I'm talking about. Go to the bar there and look for this, this little sweet old Asian lady who was fucking on top of it. One of the better servers I've ever seen in my life, which changes everything. Changes everything. Changes everything. It's it's a huge, huge asset to have someone like that that can just do all that stuff. Especially now we're like interviewing people for this new bar and you're like, you just gotta be good. You gotta you gotta be better than what you think. And that stuff like doesn't actually translate. You just need this that old Asian lady that's there just knows. It's like it's like it's, it's ingrained in her. She just knows how to do it better than anyone else. You can't teach that. She's born with it. And she kept doing the it was great. She kept uh after I I've it's like Thursday evening, so I ordered a beer, and then she came by, and I was like, can I grab another beer? And she's like, oh, you want one more? And I was like, yeah. And then like 10 minutes later, she came back, and she's like, you want one more? And gave me like a little laugh. Oh. And then by the time I got to like my fourth, she would come <laughs> over and giggle and be like, you want one more? And I was like, yeah, I want one more. So she Electric. got it. She was awesome. So high recommend if you're in that area, if you're in that terminal. Sneak on over to that bar. It was like one of the outer high top tables that was kind of a community table with like eight spots, you know, um, and go get a go get a drink. Go uh, uh, experience that service because it was it was fantastic and life changing. Um, another note that I wrote down, golf course trash cans are just too small. You ever notice this? Every golf course trash can you see is for whatever reason, one of those tiny little rinky dink fucking trash cans. Yeah. And they're always overflow always it's not even close it's like every time you see it you go by they're packed with truly cans beer cans and then if one person gets like a food item that comes in one of those little styrofoam boxy things then the whole trash can situation is over because one right. of those things takes up the whole trash can and then everyone else that has one they're just piling them up what's what who where, where are the people that are just just get bigger fucking golf course trash cans? I, I've never. Have you ever seen one that's a normal size? I'm is it a trash think, can issue or is it a maintenance issue? Are, are they not clearing out the trash cans? Well, my thing is that they're so small that I think you would need an army to handle. The oh, maintenance. are you talking about you know the little saying? ones that are next to the ball washers? Yeah, the, the real little ones. ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are small. Those are real small. Those are really small. always. And every time I you drive by one, they're like it's the overflowing. Box, yeah, they're the standard. It like comes in a package. Like a golf course gets the ball washer and the little green thing that sticks in the ground. Yes. Yeah, those are way too small. They need to they need to revamp the size of those things. If you left uh, like a bunch of trash bags out there, I'd be happy to to take that one out, place it next to it, and put a new one in. And then then a guy who comes around, he just grabs the the full one. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, and you're putting the maintenance people are behind the eight ball. They have no chance. They can't keep up no. with that. Those tiny little fucking things, and they got they got all kinds of issues. They're fucking running all over. Uh, and then the other note I wrote down is that there's a starter at Madero's who brings the starting gig more fire to the starting gig than anyone I've ever seen in my life. And they at the beginning of a, of a tournament, shotgun start. You know, it's very important where you go out in what order and the whole deal and the people lead you out. And we had one of the uh, one of the caddy girls who I believe was, you know, she stands on like the tailor made uh, far forgiveness longest drive hole. And she documents it and, and runs the show there and tells people they're going to do. So she was going <laughs> the guy. We do the national anthem and they're like, all right, wait until the person that's leading your section goes out. And you follow all the people. Everyone's like, yeah, no problem. 
And this girl gets in her cart and starts driving out because she's not part of the actual tournament. Well, the guy didn't know that. And this starter, I'm talking, she's lucky she got out of there alive. This starter immediately goes, hey, 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 and yelling. And it's, I mean, it's a quiet golf tournament. No one is making any noise. And this guy beelines down the car path screaming at her. Oh, I thought this poor girl believed she was about to be shot to death. I mean, it was an absolute seat. And this guy brought that kind of fire the whole, the whole rest of the day. I mean, he was coming by. He was on top of people with pace of play. There was like a four-second gap between the first group and the group right behind them. He was going over harping people on the tee. So I got to give a shout out to that guy because he was just all over it with the starter gig, took it more seriously than anybody I've ever seen in my life. And you got to kind of have that if you're going to run a tight ship at a golf course. Is Madera's like where we played with Nate Shot? Is that that yeah. course? Mm-hmm. I love that golf course. Awesome yeah. spot. Jimmy Butler has that huge house overlooking it. He does. A lot of those does. big California homes. God, the taxes on those things must be outrageous in that house. You guys Crazy. just ever go on Zillow and just like look around? It's awesome. I think I do that. That's just been like what I do now. Instead of going on Twitter and Instagram, I just look at Zillow. Ever since I got a house, I like had to delete the app. Oh, true. You you're looking now. You're those. looking at like, oh, what could mm. we? What could we have gotten? Yeah, you just can't. It's not healthy. True. I I still I go on it all the time as a guy who's sitting in an apartment right now. It's great. Yeah, that that was like the funnest. It's times. so much fun. You're looking at a house that's like three million bucks, and you're like, that's. I mean, I'm never going to get that. And then it it gets sold and you're just like, all right. That, or you I, like, you, you just judge the people that live there, like the way that they set it up, you know, like that wall doesn't need to be there and shit like that. Like, look, <laughs> look, look how disgusting they made that living room. I would never do that. I used to judge. Yeah, me too. And it's endless. You can look at, I look at Cedar Rapids or you just look somewhere in Montana or somewhere mm-hmm. in Florida. There's houses everywhere and they're for sale everywhere fun it is a it's a very fun activity i completely agree with that if you go like i'll even do it up near like band and dunes sometimes and just look at places that are like on the cliffs of oregon that cost a fraction of what a shoebox apartment costs to buy in new york city or in scottsdale or whatever so that is a very fun activity um so the wells fargo's next week a couple things of note uh we got to do the for the uh for the cut we got to come up with that bad boy uh, yet again. A couple guys skipping. Scotty Sheffler and John Rahm are skipping the Wells Fargo. Uh, it's a designated event. They're number two and uh, number one and number two in the world. It'll be um, uh, the first skipped designated event for each player per the PGA Tour rules. Players are allowed to miss one designated event, but if they don't play more, like McElroy has done this season and skipping two, which I'm sure he's going to answer to next week, they lose 25% of their player impact program earnings. In McElroy's case, that was obviously the $3 million that everybody was harping on. Um, Billy Horschel, Tom Hoagie, Russell Henley, Justin Rose, Lucas Herbert, and Aaron Wise are also eligible top 50 players not playing the Wells Fargo this week. I guess we'll probably hear from Rory for the first time this week on the skipping of designated events that he's been getting a bunch of shit for. Yeah, he'll have to talk about it. And the more I hear about like the three million dollars, the more like I just realize he doesn't give a fuck about that. It's money that oh. <laughs> he doesn't even have in his bank account. It's like money that oh, I'm gonna get two million instead of five. Okay, you know what I mean? It's like it's not. Mm-hmm. It's something that he's not. He doesn't have to write a check. No. So so at that point, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's all extra money. He's just like. I won five million, and now I only get two of it. Okay, that's fine. I just don't yeah. have to show up now. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I would imagine he's de- he's going to address and he's got he'll say something about the schedule. Maybe like maybe next year it'll be a little different. He, I think even I think Rom said this week like he wished he had had more time after winning the Masters than going straight to the RBC. So he's going to say all the politically correct things because that's what Rory does. But yeah, that three million bucks, dude doesn't even right you're not writing you're not losing three million dollars you're just giving up money that you haven't gotten yet. giving back house money um, right do you envision him using any sort of excuse or like an injury or like personal problems or do you think he's just going to stick to just you know didn't feel right needed the week off tired yeah i think he's going to apologize i think he's going to be like i just feel like he's always honest and we always are impressed in these types of things with how he handles it so i think he's going to come out and just be like I, you know, I get it. I totally get the criticism. If I if I were perfect, I would have just played. But, like, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I missed the cut. I just wanted to take a few weeks off. And, like, I probably shouldn't have done that. Or I get that that's, you know, contrary or contradictory to a lot of the things that I've been preaching about. I think he's just going to kind of own up to it. That's my guess. 
Yeah. He might use the word selfish. He might be, it was a selfish mm. decision. I think that's, mm. I, if we're doing Rory McElroy press conference bingo, I think selfish is on there. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think that's he might like the spin it one in a nice roar way where he's like, I just felt like I was going down a path where I wouldn't be Rory McElroy for the rest of the season. And I owe it to the fans to like reset and like make sure that I got my game right and that my head was right. And now I'm ready to go for the rest of the season. I could see him like spinning it into like, I did this for you. <laughs> Do you think on that same bingo card, does he mention the children? Yeah. That he I disappointed? Think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we're honest, Rom's Rom's kind of been burying him a little bit. I mean, Rom, mm. John Rom's been yeah. out there being like, I, I know that the kids want to see the Masters champion, so I could never let them down. It's like Rory had to be sitting at home reading that, being like, Jesus Christ, I mean, come on, dogging John. me, yeah, you fuck. So, I yeah, I think he might he might mention that. You might see Roy McIlroy. Like if this was the Sergio uh, Sergio Garcia social media PR campaign, remember that after he had the bunker incident, and then like mm-hmm. every post he had, it was like him with children and stuff. I think you're probably going to see a little Roy McIlroy signing some autographs next week at the Wells Fargo. Oh, you're, you're gonna, probably- you're definitely going to see it. And again, this is he's not disingenuous, but this is just how you do it when you miss out on an event that yeah you were supposed to go to. Yeah, and look, Rory's been great throughout the whole thing. We love, we're very, 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 very pro Rory, but. You literally, you simply deserve to get a little bit of shit when you pull um, this kind of move. I was thinking a little bit about it yesterday of like Rory for the last year and a half has been everywhere, uh, everywhere, always, all at once, whatever the fuck that is. He's been everywhere and he's gotten praise for that. And I remember during the open and when he won the FedEx last year, everyone's like, I can't believe this guy has been able to shoulder this load. He's been the guy talking and, and lobbying with players and explaining to them why the tour is doing this and that. And then he's also winning. He's playing amazing. Every week, every day, it was like this new comment. Rory handled this question, this so properly. He's the greatest. We haven't fucking heard a word from the guy in like three weeks since the Masters. That's, that's, we haven't seen anything like that in the last year and a half. Yeah, true. Yeah, we were you hearing know? from him daily, like for yeah. the whole year. Now we haven't heard from him. He's was Rory everywhere. Maybe that's part of it too. That's what he's going to be like. I just had to recharge the batteries. You know, I've been, I've been the guy. He's not going to say that, but I've, he's just, you know, he's got to recharge those batteries at some point, I guess. Mm-hmm. He's got to recharge. He's got to fucking recharge. Uh, Wells Fargo's awesome. Um, uh, Charlotte, the whole deal. Charlotte's a great town. We were there. Uh, obviously, the uh, the uh, President's Cup was just there. Big boy golf course. Tiger Woods always played it. It was always part of his schedule. So anything that was on Tiger Woods' schedule has been elevated for the last 20 years as kind of a... a a big boy event. Rory got the win there. Max Homa got his win there. That 18th hole uh, with the whole creek and everything going up the left side, kind of an iconic hole. Uh, so it's a great event, great tournament, big tournament, a lot of big names, even though those couple guys are not going to be there. Rory will be there. Almost everybody in the top 50 with uh, the exception of like a handful of guys are going to be there. So um, big event, kind of the last, I think this is the last big one until the PGA championship where this is, you know, this is going to be for a good number of players. The last time we see anybody play before the PGA Oak Hill, I believe Alex Bush, who's in the cloud right now, um, was playing golf right near, right next to Oak Hill yesterday, Bush. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I went back home, had to, had to do something back home and then just played around and, uh, they're all set up. I was, uh, playing at Rondecoit and it's, you know, right on the other side of the trees from there. That's where our event is. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I even realized that it's that close. He's like, see, you could you could see all the yeah, tents. you can see all the tents under the trees. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's Cop. right there. What's that? What's that Wells Fargo song? Oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. I've oh. never heard that. Now is that from the is that from the Music Man? Is that from the play The Music Man? Do they talk about the Wells Fargo wagon? Oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. Oh, please let it be for me. You never heard that? No, I, I also don't. Now, is that an ad or is that from is that from the Music Man? I don't that... know why the Music Man is coming in my head. I think I was in the Music Man when I was in fourth grade at McVeigh Elementary School, but I'm pretty sure. So I watch TV and I see Wells Fargo ads and I don't know that one, but I, I have from not the early 2000s? seen the Music Man. So I don't know. Frankie just went away. You've been doing this the last couple of podcasts where you disappear and then you come back and you're out of your mic. You might be back now because you disappeared again. It's a little bit like it's almost uh, I'm almost fear that it's a horror movie. And when you flash away, when it comes back, we like this moment, we don't know what's going to like anything could appear in that room at that moment. Are you back? 
I don't think so. You are. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're back, dude. This might I, I fucked this thing up at Borelli's. I, I like whatever we were doing. We were we were hooking it up to like a we were putting it inside a, a plastic cup, and like it must have just the way I did it. It does not hold anymore. This doesn't hold anymore. I fucked you gotta it get up. a new cord. Yeah. Golf capital of the world, Myrtle Beach. We're talking Myrtle Beach. Over 3 million rounds, 3 million rounds per year. Uh, it's the golf capital of the world. was recently voted America's favorite buddies trip destination. They got more than 70 golf courses. They got more than 70 golf courses at Myrtle Beach. Uh, they got two that we are absolutely blown away with, which is obviously True Blue in Caledonia. They're ranked to the top 100. They're fantastic. They got over 70 courses, so there's a bunch more as well. They got off-the-course act- activities, breweries, go-karts, mini golf bars, restaurants, nightlife, more than any other golf destination. If you want to plan a trip, go visit uh, www.playgolfmyrtlebeach.com. They get all the info on golf packages. If you want to visit Myrtle Beach, Play Golf Myrtle Beach is giving away a golf trip for you and three buddies. So pay attention um, and you can visit foreplaymyrtlebeach.com. So check out that link as well. I'm giving you a couple different links. I want you to have options. You can go to foreplaymyrtlebeach.com, enter to win a three-day, three-round golf trip with you and three buddies to Myrtle Beach. We love Myrtle, fellas. Do a buddy trip there. Do it. We went there. We've been to a couple different places, but Myrtle is – they've got great restaurants. they got great – they've got everything you want to do. We're going down to Myrtle. We're we going are going down, down to Myrtle. Myrtle. We've got a really big video plan down Myrtle. We've had this thing planned for months, um, and it's it's we're really excited about it. You guys will see – what we're talking about soon, but we're going down to Myrtle on like Monday and we're coming back Wednesday and we're playing some of those golf courses that we've loved to talk about. Um, but there's no denying that Myrtle beach has become one of the best golf destinations that you could possibly go to. And I mean, you can just, t- we just go there all the time now. And we like, ever since we went there, I've fallen in love with it and I just can't wait. We love it. It's fun. You're just going to have fun. So go to foreplaymyrtlebeach.com, yep. enter to win a three day, three round golf trip to Myrtle beach. Oh, please let it be for me. Let's see. Oh, wait a minute now. It's a song. From the Music Man? From the Music Man. Yeah. i just never seen that. It's come, It's Mm-mm. from the me Music either, Man, man. That's a show on Broadway? Yeah, dude. It's made, It, it could have been. They sing about Wells Fargo in this? I guess so. I, that's how that's I remember crazy. it. That's crazy. That's how I was like, it had to have been a fucking... Are we allowed to play this or is this like... For play like a little seconds? bit of it. Play it. For like 10 seconds? Yeah. Play it, dude. Fucking play it. The Wait, top comment to on YouTube is, this is how I feel after I order something off Amazon. <laughs> it's, it's a great <laughs> song. Let's rip it. You know what I got to get, by the way? We were about, I'm going to get a record player. You guys talk me into that. You guys one, have yeah. record players, right? I do have one, yeah. I actually was thinking about it this morning because it's a rainy day and I can't go anywhere. Not that I really go anywhere anyway. But I was going to put on the record player, just play a couple Sturgill Simpson records and just oh, hang out, dude. How nice is that, dude, with the rain? A little, ah, oh, it's so soothing. I recommend it. And it's a cool thing. Like it's maybe a little lame that you're getting it because it's cool, but I got one because it's cool. Like, and then you buy records off Amazon. It's fun, dude. It's really fun. There's this, this little kid. He's got a little bit of a lisp. I remember that he'd jump out and he, and I remember that being a huge role in the McVeigh version of, of the music man. But yeah, you gotta listen to him. I hope I get my raisins from Fresno. The DA arts and a cannon for the courthouse square. Oh yeah! <laughs> it's yeah. amazing how things can uh-huh. just sound old. Yeah, that's I yep. just know if you would play that, and we hadn't been talking about it. I'd be like, that's an old ass thing. Well, why they used to talk like that? <laughs> like, I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna go to the bakery and I'm gonna get myself some bread and then I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna give my wife a smooch and then we're gonna sit down and we're gonna watch the program. Like, why did yeah. they talk like that? Why couldn't they just be like, yo? I'm going down here. I'm going to get this. I mean, maybe not yo, but like, hey, I'm going to go get some bread. I'm going to come back. <laughs> We're going to watch movies. We're going to have like dinner. like your 1920s like Yankees broadcaster voice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Babe Ruth has done it again. We're here at Yankee State. It's just like, what are you talking about, Because it's not how dude? people actually talk back then. It's just when they were in, in a play or when they were doing a Yankees broadcast. No, it felt I think like they, they had talked to... like that. No way. No, yeah, I don't man. think so, dude. I think I, it's the way too the much recordings were. No. no, I think it's got to no. be the recording just couldn't get it right. Like, I, that, they definitely there's no way everyone just spoke like they it. were. No way. No way. 
I just yeah. think that was language. I think that was the English language back then. I think it was more proper. I think it was like, I think it just was very, very different. I, I think the way they spoke was like, I think but they had a little saying, bit of an accent. I'm they saying had a little bit of an old accent. Away from the stage, away from the microphone, if I went to the store, is, are they going to be talking to me like that? I think they'd be like, I think, I think it would, I think it would stun you. I think if you went in a time machine and you went to the Wells Fargo Center or whatever they had and you said, I want to pick up my package, the way the person would speak to you would, would blow your mind. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I, that, the, the, I think it'd be it feels, like, hey, Trent. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Hey, Mr. I, Ryan. I know they would call me Mr. I, like Mr. Ryan. True. Like feels like very true. official. It felt very more. You don't think they'd be like, we're going to go down there. <laughs> It just felt, like, I don't know. Dan Soder says, I'm going to yeah. get me a car. White that picket can't fence. be how they spoke. <laughs> I got myself a house, a, a picket fence. I just know, I feel like everyone would be wearing like a nicer, like a nice suit. Everyone wore suits everywhere and they'd be like, Mr. Ryan, welcome to the Wells Fargo, I guess. Is that if that we're staying with Wells Fargo? <laughs> Dude, do you know how um, wild it is to I don't think know. that like people in, like people in 1890 believed that 1890 was the most futuristic modern time yeah that's ever. stunning yeah ever like they didn't know that they lived in 1890 they were like mm-hmm. this is it this is the we're in the future like we have there's like oil and trains and shit this is crazy and we're like right we're like dude you lived in 18 <laughs> like you're that's mm. you're an ancient like yeah you're no like you're just too old that's like antiquity basically and then people that lived in rome in like the year 50 ad Mm -hmm. we're like this is it dude there's a giant fucking coliseum and an aqueduct and like this is insane and we're like dude that was two thousand years ago what are you guys doing what are you doing i've been on tiktok i've been on tiktok we're in the future right you gotta put yourselves in those shoes now and be like what's you can't know because it's impossible but people are gonna be saying that about us in 100 years 200 years yeah they're gonna be playing tiktok these guys a hundred years ago we're look at these ancient fucking people what were they doing it is true that this podcast is going to pretty much live forever the audio files live forever yeah, yeah. that's bizarre when we listen to four play episodes like, well, first of all if you're listening to this explode. in in that in 200 years yeah, like, not 200 years not once 200 the sun years. explodes it's over but no but that's going to take a long time you think i think that takes like billions of years dude i think we're yeah. billions of years away from that dude how about this uh, the James Webb stuff. That's I was, so I got... unsettling, though, that at some point it's <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's inevitable for this to end. Like I like it. Have, have people understood that? Has everyone listening to this really grasped the fact that we factually know that this world will not exist at some point in the future? Like, there's no hope. There is no hope for it to for it to stay forever. It well, that's will. Elon's point is we have to we have to find another planet like we just don't have a choice like this right otherwise not only will we be go- like all traces of all of this will just be gone like it just gone. not even close to any salvageable trace that all of this occurred gone even if we've got like a billion years before it happens we've got to figure out how to get off here and live somewhere else in that time frame mm-hmm. and we just have to build well like, Think about how long it took to build all these cities and all this stuff. We just have to start from scratch. Like, really, not to, that long. Didn't take that long. Not it that really, long like, relatively, of, relatively of time. The it idea, was like a fucking fraction. Like a think about it's been like I don't know. However far you want to go back, a couple thousand years, and even that's pushing it. It's been a couple hundred years since things have really taken off. Think about a civilization, a couple hundred that can keep keep things together enough that doesn't destroy itself. If it can go for a few, even a couple thousand years, a million years, who knows what sort of uh, advancements you can have. But the problem always ends up being is it ends up destroying itself. So yeah, 200 years from now, if it all just goes to shit because we drop nuclear bombs on each other, then you got to start all over again. I don't think the human civilization is capable of keeping itself together for long enough to have an exit plan is my guess. Like, What if Mars yeah. just nuclear bombed itself? Yeah, just like ten billion years ago or something. You know what I mean? Like, just they fucking yep. just they just nuked themselves. Dude, I was watching this YouTube video about the Mars, the latest Mars rover that's over there in this thing, and like this thing's unbelievable, dude. What this what this guy does and how this guy like cruises around, takes selfies, takes like takes fucking scoops up samples, and then has the technology within himself to study those samples and send the results 
like via radio signal back to earth. And then there's another fucking thing that they're sending out there that is going to actually pick up the stuff from this guy that this guy has been holding on to, like some interesting rocks and stuff that this guy's been like, you guys are going to have to come check these ones out. And we're like sending a fucking another item there that in the next few years is going to get there, grab some of this stuff that this guy says is interesting, this Rover guy, and they're going to bring it back to earth and be like, let's check this shit out. How fucking crazy. It's crazy. Is that? Crazy. Like, what are we talking about? The man? thing we got to think about, and I think I saw this on TikTok. I, TikTok, man, it makes you think about things that you just you weren't thinking about. I can't but for get some away reason, from the breastfeeding videos on Instagram well, reels. That's your, that's, a, that's a personal issue. But it's not a personal issue. I, I don't know when it started. Stop, you, and it knows if you even pause like for half a second, for and it's gonna be like this guy loves breastfeeding videos. It's Do you ever try to trick time. the algorithm? You ever one time, I think I, I saw time, it. Yeah. I, I saw yeah. it pop in there, and I go, "Now, what the fuck is that?" And that what the fuck is that has ruined my. My my whole entire being on Instagram, my whole timeline, everything my about my discovery thing is page. just TNA. Mine is exclusively <laughs> TNA. I gotta get golf. I gotta click on some of these golf ones. You gotta start watching just swings. People What'd you swing. see on TikTok, Trent. Oh, it was that the question of sort of what we were talking about before, where if a civil if a civilization is able to keep itself together for let's say a million years, that isn't us. That's someone else. Like the way we look at aliens now is. Oh, did you see that UFO in the sky? I think aliens are here. But if there's a civilization that is a, was able to keep itself around for a million years that didn't destroy itself, they're probably so advanced that we're, they've got the guy could be standing right next to me. We're talking technology that is just like just not even we can't think of it because we haven't been around that long. Like if a civilization has been around that long, we th- we think that they're going to show up and their spaceship is going to hover over Manhattan. No, dude, they're going to they're just going to be in my apartment already right now and I just don't know it. They they it's they're on a communication level that's like a thing that you're not thinking about. Right, we're thinking right. about it in our terms. Though our terms are if this exists, we're talking millions of years of advancement, you're not even looking for the right thing. Like they say are are the human like I can't see all the particles that's flying right. around, but like at some point another civilization they may have even been born with that ability or like they have possessed the technology to be able to like see that and interact with that and like be that you know what i mean like be the particles i mean right. it, it, it sounds insane that sounds like we're saying crazy shit but like is it though isn't it crazy that we're all just fucking particles like we we're think not about, actually sitting down on our chairs right now we're actually floating you ever see you'll that? see videos of no, jet no, no particles can actually touch each other yeah they, they don't touch each other we're not right. flo- like i'm not touching these these airpods or i'm actually not even touching these you're right not now. touching them at a surface level you're not touching, like I'm touching them but i'm just yeah. not dude well, why does uh, it feel like it though that my big my big gaping hole don't take it anything oh, wow. my big gaping hole with all this is that we just there's one thing we're just missing about it because there's just no way that the distances make sense like there's just no way like there's there's like oh yeah this this galaxy is like a billion light years away so you would have to travel for a billion years at the speed of light to get there <laughs> right. that's just not that's like we missed something that's there's just a different way to do it there has to be there's just no i can't that's not that's just not comp- like you can't have that. I can't. We can't have that. In this, right. In this right. I saw something the other day that was they were like, <laughs> if you travel this fast, it would take you this fa- long to get to the moon. If you travel this fast, it'd take you this long to get to Mars. And then the one to get out of our galaxy or whatever it was, you would have to travel at the speed of light for 45 billion years to get outside of it. It's like, well, well, then what? I don't understand. It's, I don't even guys, understand what that means. Science, science. You guys, you guys are missing something. Like that's just not. That's not real. You got to figure it out. So there's some other civilization. They just hit a button and they just get wherever they want to get. They're like, oh, we're gonna go check on these Earthlings. We're gonna hit the A button and we're just there. <laughs> like there's no. Right. They don't have to travel for 45 billion years at the speed of light. Like they're in fucking the Millennium Falcon. What are we talking about here? There's no <laughs> way. We lost Frankie again. Mm, no, Frankie, Frankie, Frankie has calling. exited the pocket. Dude, the best part is that we're talking about how sophisticated <laughs> people are, and we can't even record a podcast. At properly. some point, <laughs> at some point, they will. I'm back. At some point, they will figure out how to move particles from one place to another if they haven't already. It's just a matter of will they be able to do like. Like the mind and and the thinking and the brain, you know what I mean. I I guarantee that at some point in the future they will be able to take your being and just zap you somewhere else. 
maybe it's, not yeah. in the galaxy, but in, in another part in the world. They will they'll figure out how to recreate your molecules by just like taking yours and then producing yours somewhere else. I just know it. I think they're doing that with like actual objects already, um, right? Like it's almost three D imaging where they're taking something and then they're just like producing it somewhere else. It's like that's a very obviously not the what I'm explaining, but it feels like the ground level of it where you're like you have this idea and you just throw it into the computer and it just produces it. It just makes it out of whatever matter that's there. I do think at some point they will make humans to just be like, I need to be in China and you're just going to like be zapped there. But will they be able to do the thinking and the mind and the creative? Like, will yeah, that all the memories go with it? And like keep Memor- the same, will yeah. that go with it? And that's where it starts to become like, what is this whole thing that we're doing here anyway? You know what I mean? Like what are memories? What is thinking? What is all of that stuff? I, yeah, I know. I, I agree. I just think it's heavily dependent on whether we can keep this thing going or not. Cause even if you look back at, um, a TikTok again, I'm, I'm in pyramid TikTok about like, how did these things get built? And no, we don't have the a clue. Water, Nobody has water, a clue. Water levels. Everybody's got a theory. I saw the water one the other day. It's it's nobody really knows. And it, whatever the traces of what it was got wiped out by something. So we just don't know what happened. They're just the pyramid survived, but the way that they did it seems to have not survived. So th- whatever built it is gone. Dude, the they were just on like peyote and shit, and they like saw that you know their their brains went to a place where it's like, oh shit, this is how you do stuff. You just got to take a bunch of LSD. Yeah, I know. I've seen I've seen a lot of this stuff online uh, where it's like aliens came down and just showed us how to do a bunch of shit and left. And that like like isn't there wasn't there a huge advancement in technology in like the seventies or the eighties where it's like like shit just started popping off where like the internet just got invented and everyone's like what what are you talking like where did this fucking where did this even come from like who well, even who even thought about doing this and how is it moving this fast. Steve Jobs took a bunch of LSD and made the Mac computer. I just watched again because I saw it in the movie theaters. I watched the Ashton Kutcher Jobs movie. It's good. He looks like Steve Jobs a lot, so I can kind of get behind it. He's mm-hmm. not the best actor in the world. He's good. Um, See, it's that's what good, we're talking about. I, yeah, it's a good movie, but um, they make him look like a fucking huge asshole, which I think, I think he, he was. was. Yeah, he was. He was, but he didn't we, like invent shit. You know what I mean? Like he yeah. didn't. He didn't he, do shit. He may have thought about it, right? He thought he. You gotta have so, an idea. He saw like someone fucking around. Steve Wozniak like was fucking around with it. Steve Wozniak was like designing it in his living room, and and Jobs is like, "This could be the future." Like that's where he had the vision. Gotcha. Where Wozniak's like, "This is just a cool thing I want to jerk off to." Like it's just like, yeah. yeah he also, I feel like, because I've I've gone down all those rabbit holes too. He like he was the bold visionary not necessarily the genius like coder and he would got it like he was like the iphone like we're gonna have he just was like the iphone's the thing i don't necessarily know how to make it but here's what i want you guys to make and then like the ipad like we talk about we all have ipads now he was like yeah the ipad's gonna be the thing and the fucking ipod which they started with like nobody nobody was doing that shit and he was like this is what it this is what it's gonna be we're gonna put ten thousand songs onto this little white ipod and nobody thought of that you know, I don't think he was some genius that knew exactly how to do it, but he's like, Hey, you minions that work for me, build an iPod. They built an iPod. He put it, he's in his black turtleneck and fucking jeans and up there with the screen. Next thing you know, everybody's got to have an iPod. That's like, he was unbelievable at that shit. And as yeah. far, I actually saw Bill Burr talk about it. it was a long time ago on Conan. I don't know if he ever put it in one of his specials or anything. He's saying that exact same thing. Like basically Steve Jobs had the ideas, but he didn't have the idea to actually make it work and then when they would present all these things he'd go out there in his turtleneck like i'm the genius look at look at what i did it's a he very was good at he was good at um speaking and also like um pushing the envelope in, within his own company like there was one line i think in the movie where he's like selling the very first apple computer to like a local computer guy and the guy's like the computers don't go for this like and he's basically saying like you can't compare what i'm giving you to anything else that's ever been done like this is new so like I make the price, you know what I mean? Like he was, he was like a visionary in that point where it's like, who would even think of to, to describe something like that where you're like, no, no, like you're comparing that to just something that you already know exists. This is right. like, we've been, you've right. just like, you've just peered into a new dimension. And like, I tell you what that price is now. And it's just like, oh shit, you're right. Like, yeah, it's a personal home computer. that's never been done before. I also, and I, I brought this up a couple months ago on this podcast, but it's like, didn't it feel, it's such a fucking shitty thing to say, like a dumb loser in his fucking house to say this right now. But like, doesn't, didn't it feel like it was easier to invent stuff 
like back then. Doesn't it feel like everything's already fucking been invented? You know what I mean? But it's such a dumb thing to say because like you could just come up with the next phone, just no one's gonna come up with what that is. But someone's gonna do it. There's like it's right. AI. millions it's of like things that are gonna AI be invented in the next ten years. Like millions like of things are gonna thing. be invented. Like we're just like, what do you mean this thing's coming up? Like, what do you mean this like Snapchat AI is answering your questions that you answer? You're just like, what is that? I don't even know what that right. is. We, we did talk about it because and I was saying yeah, I'm stunned when new things are invented. Just like well, at wasn't it point- just easier to like make a refrigerator for the first time and like ah. like oh like our food's just going bad we need something to be cold and you're just like all right let's build this like box that can get really cold and it'll just like preserve all the food and you're like that's a fucking invention and like oh like we can't like we can't move from this place to that place we need like something that can like roll and you're just like oh it's a wheel like <laughs> just like a lot easier than thinking of like secondary thought processes from a fucking internet base called AI. And like, I don't know. It just feels like it's way more revved up. It's almost like comparing sports from 2023 to like 1920, where it's like, it's way harder to score a goal in the NHL now than it was in like 1937, where it's just like, things just weren't as advanced and it just felt like it was easy, but to them it wasn't easy. No, I get that. I get that. Think about how many ten, like tens of thousands of years and billions of people it took for someone to be like, all right, we've been doing, we've been fighting with this bow and arrow and a sword forever. What about a gun? <laughs> yeah. Like, what have, what about a gun? What have we, like, right. It took billions of people that lived and died and went through war before someone was like, oh, we're going to do it with a fucking gun. We're going to put this gunpowder. We're just going to shoot metal balls at other people. Like, that's way better than these fucking bows and arrows. And that almost got to look at it in a way where it's less. Brain cells listening to this, but <laughs> it's less about. Inventing something new as it is improving on the thing that's kind of already there. Bow and arrow gun example. Right. Even the computer, like the first computer was this the size of this whole apartment building. Like the whole every floor was like it's like this is one computer. And now we've got it in our phone and you can it's tinier. It's like less about Yeah. Like even refrigerator was like I'm sure the first one was huge and they're like, Yeah, we can keep three steaks in here. Right. <laughs> and now you can you can you got huge refrigerators that are efficient and you can put them everywhere like that's what it's about you you're rarely 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 going to come up with an original idea like a super original idea all the Even original the iPhone, ideas have been taken i've still i've still never gotten a good answer for just how they kept things cold before electricity in hot places there's just no down answer below right is it down below down down below what everybody had a I think cave you dig a hole, like, what are we talking the, about it's I, cold I think you ever feel right. the bottom you ever feel the bottom of like, like you stick your hand in dirt and the dirt's all cold not out like in arizona it's 100 degrees out here that uh, i think if you dug deep enough in arizona you'd start to get some chill in that ground i really do i think if you but went that's like what i'm saying every person then just had down. a they had a hundred foot deep cave Maybe. everybody no it's chill. Like it's 100 foot i don't know if it's 100 feet i think it's shallower than that Peloton is more than just a bike company. They actually make a treadmill and a rower as well. Did you guys know that? I did know that. I did you not can know discover that. a whole new world of exciting classes. I got this little bug flying around all over the place. I was uh, wondering exciting... what you were doing with your hands there. It's like a little gnat thing flying around in this, in this place. That was a good uh, workout. Your hands were moving. <laughs> I got a whole new world of exciting classes that change. Look at this thing, man. That change, working out from another dreaded task is something you want to stick with. Move to your own beat in life and in your workouts. You can find what gets you moving with everything from gospel to metal rides, an EDM walk, or a scenic row through San Diego. How nice is that? The Foo Fighters. The Foo Fighters class for me is is a no-brainer. Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. They just came out with a new song, Rescue. It's really good, actually. Really, really good. It's like old Foo Fighters shit. It's awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, on the Peloton, I love just picking the right music. That's the biggest thing for me. That's what motivates me hearing a good song. And the amazing part is, and I don't know what the, the tread or the, um, or the rower, but with the bike, they'll actually make like the beats and the down beats kind of similar to what the song is doing. So you can really get going. That cadence is very, very right on par with the metronome of the music and you're just on going. Par. So you're like, nice. as your foot kind of goes down, you're pushing that beat what if i say i'm not like the others and you're just like fucking going and it works man it really does work so they're doing something right they're doing something right try peloton tread row or bikes risk-free with a 30-day home trial new members only not available in remote locations see additional terms at one peloton.com slash home 
dash trial. Once again, that's onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Will there ever be another original invention is, or is there, or is everything an improvement on what's already been invented? Mm. It's such a hard answer because you won't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I if somebody comes up with something right now, cut it, and we're what gonna could become it be though? In, in like in what in what in what facet of life could there be something that we've never seen before? Well, that's where a guy like Elon is very interesting because he with the Neuralink thing is probably the only one that we're that's gonna something. See. Yeah, that's something we talked about this a couple episodes ago. That's Neuralink the one. is something where it's like it's not it's nothing right now. No, but still, right. that's like an, that's an improvement on just like. It's kind of like connecting your phone computer. to your brain, really, instead right. of like having it here in your hand. It's just plugged into the back of your fucking matrix head. Man, people are going to hate us after listening to this. But really? It was, uh, it's just like a lot of just like, they're like, oh, fuck. I, I, you know, I don't like, I don't know how to answer if there's a fucking new invention coming. Going to have to take that gun away from their head while they're listening to yeah, make true. them listen. Bow and arrow. Could have been a bow and arrow. Do you think? Yeah. I'm not going to ask that question. That's kind of a fucked up question. Um, all right, people shot themselves the with bow and arrow. Is that what you're going to yeah. ask? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that oh. was like, was that a way that people. Oof. You go up, yeah. baby. Fire it up. No, you can just go right in. Really? Maybe not. I How? You turn it side backwards on yourself? Yeah, Again, just, I understand that's kind of grim. Think, I'm just curious yeah. about the logistics of it. Shoot it in the air and you're like, all right, here I go. Because someone like commits suicide now, you're saying you pull, get, you grab the gun, point it, pull trigger, over. Oh. But could you do that with a bow and arrow? Silence. I don't know. I guess sh- shooting it straight up, you'd have to be an unbelievable shot to shoot it straight up and then have it come straight back down. <laughs> you have to factor in the wind. Fuck. I don't know. I don't know. That's all tough. right. From I the think there used to be a game people played where, I don't know if people actually played it, but they would say that everyone would kind of stand in, the, in, in a circle. One guy would shoot a bow in the air and then everybody runs. It's electric. <laughs> it's kind of electric. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> potentially lethal, but it's... Russian roulette. With a bow and arrow. I mean... Yeah. How about Hamilton was just killed by a duel? Like that was just Yeah. Like yeah. a legitimate duel. Two guys had a feud and they had a duel and one of them just died. That can't be the way to settle arguments. I went on the I went on the White House website. <laughs> no, it's on the internet. That's what you're supposed to do. Just I went on the White House website there. a couple of weeks ago and just stared at all the president's pictures. And I just really tried to like look at them and be like, That guy like led the country. And I really tried to think of like what their personalities were like. Like if you go back and look at like the first 10 or, or 20 presidents and you just stare at them and you're like, that guy legitimately ran this country. And there's like the reason why it's where it's at right now. It's pretty impressive to just like stare at them and think about all that shit, like picture them in situations. It's this is real. We talked about going to Lowe's. We talked about the things that make you feel like you're getting older. It, it's a, it's a stage in life when you get interested in presidents, when you start to really look back at like who they were. Cause what you learn in school is very like it's shallow to a degree where you're just like this guy won this and he was the president. But if you go back and learn about them, I mean, they're some of the most interesting people that ever lived just by happenstance. You just, just like you look at the guy like John Tyler, the tenth president of the United States. You just sure. look at him and you're just like, you know, what was that guy's story? And we think about how Im- like impressively large presidents are now. Like how f- I mean, obviously it's been ramped up. Because of just like you see them everywhere, everything's a, a global um, story every single day. But like, who were these guys? You know, Millard Fillmore. Like that guy was a president of the United States. Some of the early it ones is, you don't, they don't, you don't even think about them. It is you funny just, to think about how different it is too. It's like Abraham Lincoln, dude. When he used to like go meet with people and stuff, a lot of times he just rode by himself. Like he didn't have a security detail and stuff. He would just, he would just ride places by himself. Right. Yeah. You can't do that now. You wouldn't. You the just president can't. of the United States. Like, oh, I'm just going to hop on my horse and like go talk to Tim about, you know, whatever. It's also very interesting to get into. Um, I read a book about it recently, like the how media changes over time and how the how the debates were just so different back then. We're talking mm-hmm. seven, eight hour debates where one guy gets to get his entire point out, literally gets to speak for three hours, and everyone <laughs> there's crowds of people standing around. <laughs> Listening intently, being like, okay, this is how this guy feels about a certain issue. Guy talks for four hours. Then the next guy gets to talk for another four hours. Crowd still there. Nobody leaving. Listening intently. And then that's sort of how they decide things. Smash cut to now. The debates are, it's oh boy. it's more theater than it is. And it's obviously been ramped up the last 
few years. But it's back then it was very slow and it was like, oh, that's how he thinks about this. Now it's you got 30 seconds and then you got 15 seconds to respond to whatever he says. And it's just everything is going a million miles per hour faster than it used to. Dude, back then, like they, people had nothing to do. Like, what would right. you do if you're if, if you're not working or eating a meal? Like, what are you doing? You don't it, you just read a book like you had a book. That was kind of the only entertainment option minimal in the world. Right. Like from if you woke up on a Saturday and you just were off work that day and it's 8 a.m. You wake up. What are you doing? You got there's no TV. There's no phone. There's no Internet. There's no. What are you doing? Like what are walking you doing? around? You're going to the debate. You're going to the 10 hour debate. Park. You're just like looking at birds and shit. Like, what are you Franklin doing? Franklin Pierce. Like this guy was the president of the United States. I went to Pierce Elementary. I know who that guy is. Riggs, your dad kind of looks like Dwight D. Eisenhower. Did you ever get that? Really? Hold on. Let me show me a picture. I, think I could just. I could see like a, I could see a, a resemblance. You There's see that a little bit there. You see that? Oh yeah. yeah if he yeah, threw yeah, a hat yeah, yeah. on, if he threw like a like a like if he threw like a camo hat on or like a fisherman type thing. Uh huh. Yeah, that's him right sure. there. My uh, my dad gets Where's... Mark Messier a lot too. Oh yes! Holy mm. shit! Yes. He looks exactly like Mark Messier, dude. Holy shit! Yes. Oh wow! Your dad Identical. looks exactly like Mark Messier. Identical. Dude, that's pretty would... like. Like legit could like sign autographs. I mean, identical. Dude, and when I was a kid and playing <laughs> hockey still, and I'd be walking around with my hockey bag and hockey sticks and airports and stuff, people would stop my dad and be like, and he would play <laughs> along a lot. They'd That's be like, wild. My, Mark Messier, he'd be like, oh yeah, great to me. And then after a minute, he couldn't hold it in. He'd be like, I'm not Mark Messier. I just fucking look like him. <laughs> That's electric. That's yeah. so sick. He looks uh -huh. just like him. Oh, <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And then my, my uncle... Paul, who's my dad's uh, uh, brother, obviously, he looks um, exactly like Larry David, my Uncle Paul. I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is unbelievable. <laughs> the the That's Yeah, amazing. it's uncanny. Let's see if That's I have amazing. any. I don't even know if he's on, like, Facebook. I, I want to show you a picture of my Uncle Paul, who's the man. And he looks, because he, he came to the uh, Minnesota Barstool Classic a couple years ago. And people literally thought it was Larry David. That's amazing. Wow. Look at Larry. We got to get Larry David in the mix. That guy's a big golfer. He's he was at the Lager game last night. How do we get Larry David on the show? I mean, how does how do you get the funniest guy in the world? Like, that's kind of what you're asking. I'm like, Right. How do I do that? He, he's one of the most sought after people. And he's a guy who doesn't really do interviews. What was the last know. interview you saw Larry David do? Oh, he doesn't but do I think shit. One isn't one of the episodes out at Riviera. He's probably a member at Riviera. Let's all go play Riv. You know? I go, I'll go play Riv li, with Riv, Larry David. Riv. Yeah, I would happily go play Riv. I know Dan's played it. I'm trying to find this. Uh, I got to find a picture of my uncle Paul. Dude, you're gonna <laughs> picture be your uncle Paul away. He's not a social media guy, so I got like I have no idea how to track down just a random photo of my uncle. Neither is Larry. Have these guys ever been in the same room together? <laughs> That's exactly right. I uh, I don't have any family members that look like famous people, which is unfortunate. That sucks. That's a shame. Not a one. How about you? I'm trying to look at like, um, my aunt looks like Phil Mickelson. <laughs> I told you guys that. <laughs> I think you've mentioned that before. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Phil, playing really well. He is playing, playing really well. So well. My grandpa, uh -huh. my pop pop, the, the originator of Borelli's, he looked like Larry Davis. He's got the white hair, the glasses. He would look like a more Italian, not okay. Jewish. Yeah. If you're thin. And have glasses, and you get older, you kind of look like Larry David. It's the white hair on the side yeah. that's that's the key. Yeah. Give me um, a fucking photo. My dad oh, looks like come Super on. Mario. You guys know what um you know what Mario's last name is? <laughs> no. Um didn't this is this a was this a problem recently? Do you know what Mario's last name is? No. No. It's Mario. Mario, Mario. They're the Mario brothers. Mario and Luigi are the Mario brothers. <laughs> His name is Mario Mario. No, it's Come not. On, it can't dude. be. Shut up. Go look it up, bitch. Go look <laughs> it up. Here, dude. <laughs> dude, it's the craziest mind-blowing fact of all time. They're the Super Mario brothers. Yeah, but that's just because yeah, why? Mario is the alpha. He's oh, the guy. Really? He's the one. Really? Yeah, you don't dude. think Luigi's last name is Mario? I think people you don't think his name think is. The, you don't think his name on. is Luigi Mario? <laughs> no, I don't. I think people didn't when the originators when they created. I don't think they gave him a last name, and it ended up being. The, I mean, he's the main character. If we're talking about main characters, it's called the Mario Brothers. But I, what I'm saying is, I don't think they meant it to be that was their last name. 
Yes, they did. If you look it up, he's called Mario Mario, and there's a whole story behind it. I say Mario. I, I said Mario were... to begin. I said Mario to begin because I'm conforming to fucking bullshit. But I think they but were forced I into say that. Mario, the story and everything, I think they were forced into that. I don't think 100%. that was the original. That that wasn't like Lord of the Rings where he had the backstory from the very beginning. Right. George R. R. Martin, was, was he didn't write the backstory. Think about how mind-blowing no. that is, though. They've always been called the Mario <laughs> Brothers, so they have to. their last name has to be the Marios, and you've just never thought of it. You've never <laughs> thought Mario and Luigi's last name is mario because <laughs> i never... know that it's not actually <laughs> it is though there's no it is, way dude. it is no the way. origination of it there's a whole thing mario, when did they mario? come up with the story is my question i mean now you're asking mario the question too, frank mario 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 it's like george foreman's kids all george that's fucking crazy <laughs> dude, last, uh, from the gallery. i'm gonna do a little bit more research on that and i'll get back to you about it. you know what who from the gallery is brought to you by now who is that taylor made golf wow, wow. Yeah. Fantastic golf company. Taylor made golf. We're doing a big dude, we're doing a big sweepstakes. We're giving away twenty five prizes to twenty five lucky winners. You gotta enter between now and May first, I believe. We're giving away you go to taylormadegolf.com slash barstool sweeps. Um go sign up, go check out the uh this is we're calling it the season opener barstool sweeps. But I'm talking Oh, I have I have breaking news. I have breaking news. Okay. Hmm? So originally Oh, yeah, here we go. Mario Give it to me. did not have a last name. But in 2015, 2015. Miyamoto. <laughs> in 2015. Come on. Miyamoto man. changed his mind while celebrating Mario's 30th anniversary event in Japan. Miyamoto confirmed that Mario and Luigi both <laughs> share the last name Mario, thus making Mario, 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 and Luigi, Luigi, Mario, the Mario brothers. They got forced into it. Yeah. <laughs> That was that was yep. that was plain. That's that clear as day, dude. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you didn't see that one. But it makes sense, though. It makes sense. We've just always just ignored the name. Like we've acted He's, like Mario is the main character, so they're right. gonna they're the Mario brothers. I get that it doesn't totally track. It doesn't make it, sense. Yeah, but it's just you're either, saying like what it is because that's what it is. But like if you really so think about they, the name, dude. so were but they. If you think about the name, like they just fell into the story. They had to. They called them. That's what like I was the saying. Brelli brothers. Yeah, like you were uh, making it be like when they drew Mario for the first time, they were like, "There's Mario, Mario." That's what I thought. Yeah, that's psychotic. Because the name is the the last name brothers. Like you know, you're ar- you're arguing brothers. a point that was just proved incorrect. Um, what were we talking? What were we talking about, Riggs? Taylor May Golf, dude. We got yeah. the sweeps coming. Okay, that's currently active. You got to go sign up at taylormaygolf.com slash barstool sweeps to give away twenty five prizes to twenty five winners. Prizes include everything from a grand prize, which is a full bag of new Taylor May clubs, Whoa. giving away Stealth Two drivers, giving away Spider GTX putters, sets of wedges, all kinds of stuff, sets of irons. Twenty five total prizes, and like I said, the top prize. Uh, is a full bag of new tailor-made clubs. Talk about Scotty Scheffler, who I think is number two in the world right now. Remember how dominant he was at the Players' Championship at TBC Sawgrass, how good he looked for most of the Masters tournament. He's using Stealth, too. He's obviously a tailor-made guy. So many top players are, including yours truly, all three of us, all four of us, all five of us, if you count Lurch. Um, so go to Barstool Sweeps, tailormadegolf.com slash Barstool Sweeps. Enter TaylorMade season opener sweepstakes today, and you can enter to win one of those 25 prizes. <laughs> Speaking of Lurch, um, he caught me on a day. He was texting me the other day. He caught me on a day where I was like, I, I'm, I was thinking I'm fat. I'm the fattest guy in the world. I got to get active and i gotta i gotta figure this thing out i am now i'm a part of this group with him where <laughs> we track our fitness every day and we're against other groups and okay. i have with to, benjamin severance yeah, yeah he hasn't answered a text about foreplay in like four months well he we he answers my text i guess maybe send the stuff my way because he uh we're trying we to lose we weight can... together so i'm just in this group that he runs where you know, if you walk a certain amount or if you do a certain amount of push ups, you get a certain amount of points, and you're trying to beat these teams. So it's just, it, you, I just, you reminded me of that when you brought up his name. So that's something I'm involved in. <laughs> and in, I'm kind of bringing what, the group. Who else down. is in this fucking group? Trent. It's random people that he knows that I don't know. We're all in a group chat together. And, you know, they're, they're sending messages back and forth about working out. And I feel a little uncomfortable because I don't know anybody. But, that's something that I'm currently in, and I'm kind of dead weight for the last couple of days. I haven't done anything, so okay. I'm bringing the group down. All right. Uh, from the gallery, presented by Taylor May, go to TaylorMayGolf.com slash Barstool Sweeps. 
Uh, Chris asks, if a player never won a major, how many players' championships do you think a player would need to win to be considered for the Hall of Fame? So what if somebody that won no majors, but they won five players' championships? I don't know, like, what the basis of the Hall of Fame is. Hall of Fame debates always, like, throw me off because I don't know, like, do you even have to win a major to be in the Hall of Fame? Can you win, like... 16 events and just be like a non a major list hall of fame golfer. I feel like the going rate for a for like a baseline career hall of fame career right now is like two majors and 15 wins feels like yeah i think that's what dan said on the last show because i yeah. think he actually mentioned that but it's 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 a little bit there's obviously wiggle room because i was just thinking like on hell cabrera he won two majors he won a u.s open in the masters he's not a hall of fame guy but Freddie Couples, I think he just won the one Masters as his only major, but I think he's clearly a Hall of Fame guy, right? Yeah. Yes. So there's exceptions, I guess. It's sort of the eye test almost. Like Fred Couples is a Hall of Fame guy. He's on all the teams. Everybody's boy won a major, won the Masters, got the beautiful swing. Yeah, that's something I guess I don't know enough about the Golf Hall of Fame where can you be, can those intangible things factor into your candidacy? Like Fred Couples feels like a yes. That feels like a guy who's like, of course, Fred Couples is a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Right. But I just don't Mm -hmm. know how much that weighs into it. If you win five players, that it's a pretty big deal. And no other, like, are you saying those are the only events that they won or they've also got some other PGA Tour wins? I think every time the players comes around, that guy's like, like, like immortalized. This fucking guy's won five of these things. It's, yeah. Yeah, that guy's the guy. He's like, dude, this is his tur- this is his place. Like that. I'm trying to think. Like, did uh, I'm trying to think, like Steve Elkington? I think he like he won the players like twice. I think, but he also won a PGA, I believe. I want to say no to that, but I think it probably it probably I think five does. is a number that's like really really stunning to me. Where if you yeah. win five of the same majorly elevated event, you know, state like just everything about it. Seventeen, you're just like you're dominating that place. Every year, they're making a huge deal about the players, and you're winning it. That's a pretty big damn deal. That's a pretty big. You're a big time golfer if that's happening. You're in the news for like half a decade, dude. From like, yeah. from like, if you're 25 years old to when you're 45 years old, you got a t- pretty standard 20 year career out there. You win five. I mean, it's one out of four. Like every fourth players, you just win it. Right. That's a couple of them. You're probably winning like three in a row too. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like that's right. You win. Yeah. yeah. You win two out of three or three out of five or something. You're like this guy just wins the biggest event that's not a major all the time. That I think you might get in there if you had a little charisma. I think you might get. I think in. you need some other wins. I don't know if you could just have five wins on your. That, I agree. You got to be a double that digit be. wins. I think. What a career! Five wins, five players championships. Everything else is he just he can't. The guy can't just get missed it cuts and right. So it's um, like Jack's got three, Fred's got two, Elkington's got two, Hal Sutton's got two, DL3's got two, and Tiger's got two. So that's the list we're looking at right now. But let's give a let's give a little shout out and love to our guy Hardy. Did you see Hardy posted his Instagram yesterday? And he's just rocking the Barstool it's Golf. He's rocking the Barstool Golf hat. It's crazy. I love that guy. He he. I think me and Frankie and him have a little side text, and he'll just send us videos of him like on the driving range. Just mm. grinding, like he'll literally get to a new stop, find a driving range, and he's out there. He sets his phone on the ground and like takes videos of his swing, so he loves it. I don't know if we've told this before. It's probably been removed enough now, but it might have been a year and a half or two years ago that he hit us up and was like, I got a big round of golf coming up, and I really want to rock bar stool golf stuff. We were like, no problem. He played Augusta National with like the whole Manning family, and yeah. he is wearing a bar stool golf hoodie and hat. In the, Crazy. in his picture wow. on the Hogan Bridge on the twelfth hole at Augusta National, so that guy is my fucking favorite. I love Hardy. Yeah, we love Hardy. Hardy. Yeah, we do. Um, He's the best. He pissed at actually. My speaking of my hats, head. I know that we're not like officially announcing it, but we can kind of tease it. You know, the PGA Championship hat that you're wearing right now, Riggs. All these things they sold out so fast. We still have a couple hoodies left. The white patch hoodies are still available, but the Unreal crossover hoodie, the one that goes within a fucking blink of an eye every time we. Uh, release it that sold out we are restocking i'm hearing i'm hearing that hats are gonna be available so i don't know if there's a wait list or if when you're gonna have to you're gonna have to keep um up to date with when we do release this it's probably gonna be around when the tournament actually happens the pga championship but there's gonna be a chance for once play is actually happening you're gonna be able to buy the merchandise i know a lot of people especially people around oak hill like i was talking to guys like 
um, um, who uh, Merle's Merle's has like a bunch of buddies that belong to Oak Hill. And they were like, dude, like we didn't pay attention for one day and we missed all the merchandise we wanted to get. They're like, we belong to Oak Hill. They belong to the golf club. And they're like, we want the Barstool PGA merch. And they, they couldn't get it. They were like, we it's the hats are sold out. And I told him we're restocking them. So like people want it regardless of if they want it to get for the tournament. I mean, how often do you actually like go to the tournament? Like I like to just buy shit even if I don't go there, I just like to have the stuff. It's like commemorable. It's like really cool. It's once it's fucking exclusive. So people are going to have a chance. We're, we are going to restock that. So all the people messaging us, that is coming. There was also a uh, one of the from the gallery submissions. We'll continue to move on. Alex said, is it ever okay to wear merch or gear from an event you did not attend? Bang. And I think the answer is unequivocally yes. I think the course. event is a no-brainer. I think the event is a no-brainer. The Masters is a little bit different because the Masters yeah. is like – it's when you wear it they ask you like oh what year did you go yeah but i think every like i think it's fine to wear anything else from an event it's like it's golf courses and the masters to me that i feel like you have to be there to wear it the golf course thing is an interesting one because i do get it but i also like my brother for example when i go to if i go play wing foot or i go play oakman or something i'm always like dude i'm I'm going to get you maybe a shirt from the pro shop. And he's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and like wears it all the time. So I, I don't know that like, I'm kind of with you. I don't know that I necessarily would, but events and like PGA championship gear, all that. I just think if it's cool, the logo's great. I want it. And I remember probably 10 years or so ago. So way before we were doing any of this, our friend Pete, mine and Lurch's buddy, Pete got to go to the masters like last minute. And he sent a group text out that was like, I'm going to get a bunch of hats for anyone who wants one. Do you guys want a hat? And everybody said yes, being like, I want one. So I look back on that now because we've been to events and I kind of feel a little bit more like you do, Frankie. But then looking back at my former self, who didn't have all the cool golf related opportunities and gear that we have. And I was like, yes, I want a fucking yeah. master's hat so bad. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. No, I agree with that. You can always um, lie, too. If you want to lie, you can. Just True. lie. It's just cool stuff, too. It's cool stuff to own. It's like what right. part of being alive is. You just like own a bunch of cool stuff, and then you die. And it's like that's just another cool yeah. thing. Yeah, I think if I had a master's hat and I hadn't been there or a master's shirt and someone was like, what year did you go? I'd say 2017, baby. I was there. Woo! What a I was there for the Thursday or round. Or you just like, say the story of like, yeah, like I just – like my buddy brought this for me. He went. Dude, I will say I brought uh, – when we had the classic in, in Arizona here a couple of days ago, I – brought the uh lawn chair that i bought at augusta i brought that out there and put it on the first tee and was just watching the first tee and many people were like whoa this augusta chair was this at augusta this year and i was like yeah this chair last time it was used was on the 12th hole at augusta national and they're like can i touch the chair so, you can touch <laughs> the chair. so people were like touching the chair that was at augusta and i was like i totally understood it's like yeah it's pretty that chair was at That's augusta amazing. national <laughs> they've really they've really got it figured out when people amazing. just want to touch a chair that was there I mm -hmm. get it too. Like that fucking chair was at a, you're telling me that chair right there. That chair was at Augusta National. Go, oh yeah, that chair was at Augusta. Let me touch that fucking chair. So I mean, I, to I totally get it. I understand. Hey, we got to do for the cut. Oh, Dan okay. Rappaport submitted his his for the cut for the Wells Fargo at Quail Hollow, which is a great golf course. We loved it. We were there for the players or for the um, for the President's Cup. That was snap that son of a gun. We uh, had all kinds of fun stuff with George W. Bush. <laughs> Speaking of presidents, that's the only president I've, I believe that's the only president I've ever met was George W. Bush. Um, yeah. Frankie's got a couple. You got two, Frankie? Yeah, I've got Donald Trump and W. And w. Mm -hmm. I think I just got, I just I got guess Bush. I didn't, I didn't meet Clinton either. He was at the president's company. He, he was right there. Yeah, he was right there. there. He was getting, because I was in that corner, dude. I remember he was getting dominated a little bit by W. He was like. W was in his element and 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 slick Willie wasn't he wasn't he wasn't by any stretch of the imagination like he would have lost by decision, I guess. He didn't get dominated, but he was he was beaten by George W. Bush in that corner, just in terms of just charisma and everything. He was W just was life. all over the place. He had yeah. way more life to him. What's Might the be age related those two. Um, sure. I know he's had heart age. issues. I feel like he had a huge heart surgery like twenty years ago, it feels like. And he's still kicking. Speaking of having cool things that like people like to touch, I have um I've got cufflinks from the Oval mm -hmm. Office that have just the presidential seal on them that are that it's like oh, 
when are you going to use those? Never. You, never. Yeah. I've got that and I've got a towel that has a pre- presidential, a golf towel. Okay. Because Trump was like, I heard there's a golfer in the room and he, <laughs> he flinged it at me. Dude. It's like, how do you know who even Dude. told him that? <laughs> the craziest say, experience of my life. I, like, <laughs> people are going to like politics. You can't even bring that guy's name up without people like, yeah, yeah. they're going to fucking puke on themselves. They're going to be like, yeah. what? I mean, we might like the podcast might stop just stop playing right now because I'm saying the guy's name, but um, just the craziest experience of all time. Like I have pictures on my phone that are legitimately the crazy. Like it feels like we were in like Madame <laughs> Tuzak, like a, like a legit mo- Hollywood movie set. Like I have a picture of Dave just like kind of shrugging at me, being like, "We're just in the Oval Office." Like he's just like, "We're in the Oval Office right now." Like we went from the pizza place yesterday to just like in the most powerful exclusive room. In the we're talking about like galaxies and light years and stuff. The only place where we know that there is life, it's like the most important room here. Yeah, you know what I mean. And like we sure. made it that as a civilization, so maybe it doesn't have actual any value to like the galaxy, but it has a lot of the, importance here. For what civilization has built up, it's the most important room in the world. I would say it's the office of the most yeah. powerful man on the planet. <laughs> it's crazy, and we were there while it was like being used. Like it's and, not like it was a tour. It was like there were phone calls being made. I don't care who it was. You were that's one of the coolest. Could have been anyone that's ever existed. You were in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, the <laughs> sitting President that's of the United thing. States. On a what non, are we, what, are we, what are we doing here? That's, yeah, it right. was fucking. It, it was is psychotic. like the way that the, the <laughs> I haven't talked the, about like, it in like four years. It's like the craziest thing that's ever that happened man into office. That's it's the craziest it works, thing that's <laughs> ever happened to me. And I had a <laughs> crazy crazy. mustache. Right, that was my favorite part. I had an Islanders during an Islanders run. It was right after the Islanders run. It was during COVID. Um, the Islanders were like on that huge, I think they stopped sports at that point. Remember? It was just like, everything was just kind of stopped. Oh yeah. And, um, yeah, it was just fucking, I had a huge mustache. I was growing it. I think we had played like Kevin Kisner. I had the same mustache uh-huh. for Kisner. Was it wasn't really an Islander scramble. thing. I think it was like a COVID mustache. Um, yeah, yeah no, you're... presidents are cool, man. Like the discourse presidents. has gotten so crazy in that. Even that video that I put up with George W. They had like you're a war criminal because you shook his hand. It's, it's like crazy. I don't know, man. I, <laughs> I, I don't, don't know. So. I don't. I, I don't really... think so. And people I, like, are crazy. Crazy. On... Last night, someone uh, Stu Finer bought a bunch of Bud Light down to the <laughs> seat, and somebody looked at me and goes, "Are you going to drink that?" And I said, uh, "I looked at him. I said, are you a psychopath?" And he's just like, that's just crazy. I was just like, you mean like the most popular beer ever made? You mean like, you mean Anheuser Busch? I was just like, I don't know what you're like, whatever you're talking about. You you have the right to talk about whatever you want. But like, yeah, I'm gonna drink the. It's Stu just bought me a beer. I'm just gonna drink this beer. The I'm world's gonna, actually crazy. The world's in that regard where it's insane. just like, I, I don't. It's fuck. It's beer, man. I don't. Let's know just what, be normal. Like everyone yeah, can just be normal. Let's just be normal. Everyone just be normal. But. The fact that like I've always been afraid to talk about being in the Oval Office has always been such a weird part of my life where it's like I've hid I've like I have a picture on my phone of me with the president at the desk. <laughs> it's just like I've well, never once is, talked about it. The thing that happens it. is it gets just like I gotta hide it. It's like everything is so sound? crazy you do have, that it's just unfortunately it you do kind of have to hide it. It's so stupid. Right. Yeah. It sucks. It's do. just like not worth posting because then you gotta fight everybody. I know. The people are fighting each other in the comments and it's just like Well, luckily I, the people listening to this show, like you feel like everyone's like just a normal person. Like obviously yeah. There's people out there they're probably getting mad but it's like at some point you just gotta just li- like just be normal right? like on all accounts i love about the barstool classic is how you really learn that everyone that's is just pretty normal like all the just people normal. that we chit chat with and we see out at these golf events that we host they're just normal people that are laughing and hitting good shots bad shots hanging out with their buddy they took the day off work with their dad and they're just normal human beings that are happy to be there yeah and it's like you got to remind yourself of that but that is the internet's that is so sick you were in the oval office with the sitting president of the united states that's just awesome there's no other way around that Dude, no, I got a message from a guy we talked about. Um, this is way off topic. Um, I th- uh, no. We talked about video coaches, um, how they do the replays and the challenges. Oh, I got that You got too. that DM? That guy would be mm-hmm. pretty cool to talk to. He's the assistant video coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets, and a large part of his job involves challenging plays during games. Would happy to be talk- Would happy to talk to you all and give you some insight into what we do. That would be pretty fucking cool. Just yeah. fucking get him on right now. We send this guy a link. <laughs> yeah. a, he might be it's it is a saturday he might be i guess he's emailing us on a saturday. he just fucking emailed us he's dming everybody let's get this fucking guy out here what else are we doing it's saturday i got I nothing know. going on i got a tuna I'm, i got a tuna bagel downstairs 
I probably got Ooh. one day left until oh, what does this come out Tuesday? We'll get canceled for talking about all this stuff. Say True, this Donald is it. Trump. This is our last show. Hopefully, nobody made it to this part of the show. Um, <laughs> I won't sleep for three nights now. I'm Why? playing golf in the I'm morning. Just, with, just joking. Corey Kispert with our boy Corey Kispert. Oh, oh cool. Good looking guy. Yeah. That is the one thing. It's like it's the it's a fucking joke. Guy. It's the joke where it's like go to the golf course. You're, you're the Islanders will have a tea time tomorrow, and it's like yep, like we're definitely going to golf for sure. Like you know, <laughs> like like Corey Kispert missed the playoffs. He's just golfing. Like <laughs> that's what it's these true. guys love to do. It, it's do. like it shouldn't be a day. Like, yes, it's a day because like you should be playing hockey. You should be winning. But like if it wasn't Don't raining, play that today, sport you love. I would definitely be playing with them right now if it wasn't raining. Go out on that beautiful course and play that fun game, you loser. It's like, well, I mean, oh, okay. It's, like a, okay. it's a place that you should go to, like, get your mind off it. Like, you love the sport of hockey so much that you need to, like, go out and play another activity just to keep your fucking, like, your mind okay. You can't just sit at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll see if this guy calls by the time we finish, but I doubt it. I doubt it. We'll get him on next show. It's perfect yeah, we'll get him for on hockey next playoff show. time. I, lo- I would, lo- yeah, that's, that's just cool. It's like what goes on back there, dude. How about the hand pass one from last night in the Bruins game? Did you see that, Frank? I don't know if you were like because the games were at the same time. No, dude, they put up the score a couple times on the jumbotron. Like the people were like moaning and gro- like it was crazy how many goals were being scored from in that Bruins dude. Panthers game. Like we would check, so, it would be four three, then it'd be four four, then it was five four, then it was five five, then it was six five. I'm like, what's happening? Dude, the Bruins, I believe, were down 3-2, and then they score to go 3-3, and then they score again to go 4-3, or maybe it was 3-2, either one, like really quickly. And the fucking – one of these guys, one of these video coach guys, clearly saw something because it, it, watching in real time, we didn't have volume at the bar. We were up at Izzy's, but like in real time, I don't think anybody noticed shit. And then they go to uh, review, and you're like, what are they reviewing? And they're reviewing a hand pass in the corner, and the puck, which is, like, spinning on the ice, one of the Bruins guys is down, and it, like, grazes his finger. And then the Bruin, other Bruins player picks it up, like, basically, you know, and it was technically a hand pass. Like, it definitely was, but it, it had zero effect. The puck moved a millimeter from this puck grazing the guy's finger, and they call no goal. They call the goal back Holy because it was shit. technically a hand pass. So this fucking video guys, that's got to be similar to our Blue Jackets guy, were like that's they were on the ball. They're like that was an illegal play. We're gonna call them back on that. It was fucking nuts. I haven't watched all the um, highlights yet because I just can't bring myself to do it. I saw the final mm-hmm. goal. It was right in front of us, but I went back and watched to see how the fucking went in in the Islander game. I went off his fucking skates, just like a freak shit. Um, when the when the when the um. Hurricane scored the game tire with like 10 minutes left. The game tying goal. I saw the ref go to the, the, I think it was the linesman, go to the referees and do this, like the hand pass motion. And they all kind of huddled. And I, like, I actually said, like, what's that? Like, I point, it was on the other side of the ice. I'm like, what are they talking about? And then, the, then everything just kept going on. Like, the, they dropped the puck. It was 1 1. I'm like, what the fuck was that? So I wondered if the Islanders had hand pass and then Carolina had cleared it by just touching the puck. Um, but originally, like when I first saw that hand motion, I thought that Carolina had hand passed and they were going to like disallow the goal. And then I went on Twitter and saw at the same time, Ryan Whitney wrote what a hand pass that was. And I'm like, wait a minute. Did we just get fucked? Like, I didn't know. I didn't know if they were mm-hmm. talking about it online. Cause like when you're at the mm-hmm. game, you have no idea what's going on sometimes. You don't know the conversations that are being have, had. So I'm like, I, I, it was at the same time, dude. It was crazy. And it just I had also do, do think it. that, that Kane's goal. Um, he did pass it to himself. They talked about that, but he didn't grab it. So he there just, was a there was a yes. conversation about a drop. Yeah, they were wondering because you, what you can't do, what you can't can't catch cover it, and it, throw it down, can't but you can it. sort of lead it to yourself. Is that? Yeah, that's what yes. happened. Now, what did I get yep. fucked? You or can't was it like the right close call? your hand. No, it looked like he just kind of brought it, it down. It. Yeah, did he close his hand on it or what? I don't think he did. I wish he. That's had, always a gray area too, because in order to like when the puck's in the air, in order to get it with your hand down to you have to like control it. In order to control it, you have to close your hand to a degree. Like you can't yeah. just you can It's you know, it's not hotcakes. You're not like this with it. You yeah, like grab it and throw it down on the ice. So it's always a little bit of a gray area. I mean, like that would be tough to like disallow that because I mean, um, earlier in the game. Freddie Anderson like went to go shoot the puck down and Clutterbuck just caught it and put it down and shot it back at him. It's like obviously he caught it with his hand. Like clearly. <laughs> clearly yeah. fucking he didn't like his palm hand it and pop it up. I was no. fired up for that cow goal. I mean, I don't Oh my like, god, dude. I don't want to go. We don't have to get into it. We don't have to get into it. It was right in front of me too. But it's I just, just I know I played golf that we all played golf with that guy and I was, he's such a normal no disrespect to Cal. He's a normal looking guy. Everyone else is Barzell and 
Brock, who's eight feet <laughs> tall. He's a little disrespect. He's going to love that, though. I like Cal's that. just kind of like, I saw him, and I was like, that's like a normal <laughs> a guy. And then I watch, him, just... <laughs> I watch him score a playoff goal, and I was, I was losing my mind. Yeah. I was fired Dude, up that guy's that. fucking awesome. I love him. I hadn't talked to him since the scramble, basically. And whenever, uh, when, when the Penguins lost to get you guys into the playoffs, I texted him like, wow. And he responded in two seconds and was like, how about that? The boys got life. I how about the fact that I didn't tell you guys this. I forgot to tell you guys this. How about the fact that Cal Clutterbuck, I get a text the other day from Justin Thomas and it's a Cal Clutterbuck jersey. Happy birthday, by the way. It's Saturday. Happy birthday. Birthday. Happy birthday, Justin old, Thomas. 30 years old. Impressive guy. Really impressive first 30 years for you, JT. He for texts me and he goes, um, for, he takes a picture of a jersey. It's a Cal Clutterbuck jersey. And he goes, can you believe this guy? And Clutterbuck sent him a jersey like framed and it said to the only Pens fan I know and he, he signed it <laughs> and and I was like that's just and JT's like I was like well now you have a real big decision to make because you have that wall of fame he has that wall of fame in his house where it's like Michael Jordan Steph Wayne Curry. Gretzky yeah I mean it's everywhere even during Aaron the Sunday Rogers. conversation like Glenny Balls was talking about it being like it's the craziest wall ever I think it's in the background of the Sunday conversation you can see all the jerseys um and I'm like, are you going to put Cal Clutterbuck up there next to like Wayne Gretzky? It's like, <laughs> that's actually hilarious. That. <laughs> and he's like, I sent it back to him because I'm going to use it as a doormat or something like that. <laughs> Clutter's the fucking best, man. And he's a stick. I would put he him really as, is. I'd put him as the best. I, I would put my money behind Cal Clutter, Clutterbuck as being the best hockey golfer. I would. He He's up there. He's got to be because he hits it a mile, dude. Mm-hmm. Dude, he shot like a 66 one. I text him. I'm like, how'd you play today? He's like, I shot a 66. I'm like, he's, he goes low, low. Like low, yeah. and Kisner said he's a player. Kiz played with him for a week when they went on that trip that weekend. And Kiz is like, never seen a guy drink and play as well as he can. Yeah, they went to that a uh, hoopy match match club that everybody raves about in like South Carolina, or wherever that is. That's uh, right. Yeah, he's he also is the most impressive tee off on top of a beer can player I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, he's in, he's really really impressive. I'm set, this guy's going to come on and far. This guy's going to come on and talk about being a video coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Vroom is the better way to buy your next ride. You never have to haggle or negotiate the price of a car so you know you're going to get a good deal. Obviously, buying a car is an enormous decision. With Vroom, you can shop thousands of cars right from your phone, have your next ride delivered right to you you have a full week or 250 miles um, to make sure your new ride is right for you. Plus, all cars on Vroom.com come with a 90-day limited warranty and one year of roadside assistance nationwide, giving you peace of mind while on the road. We love Vroom. Vroom's just the greatest, newest way to do it, fellas. This is the future. Shopping for cars online. And you, you like they're saying, you get to test it for a week, 250 miles, whatever it is. If you need a car, this is the way to do it. I might need to just get a Chevy on Vroom. Like, that's just everything's all combined Boom, at this right. point. That's an amazing combination. We're just kind of <laughs> hitting you from all different aspects of yeah, we are. things that you need to do. We want you, we to, want want you to be in the right it. car. It's going to be a Chevy, and it's, you're going to get it from Vroom. That's kind of right. what we're saying. This is all kind of working. Our sales team really has, like, packaged a nice little, like, if you need, if you need a car, we've got you covered in all aspects. We're telling <laughs> you, you what car, car to get and where to get. 2023 you're gonna need a car you can trade in your old car when you buy your new one you can even just sell your old car to vroom when you sell your car on vroom you get a price instantly and they'll even come pick it up it's the better way to buy a car um you could buy a car from vroom entirely online next time you need to buy a car just grab your phone go to vroom.com and check out thousands of cars that's v-r-o-o-m.com check out thousands of cars at vroom.com So now we're just joined by an assistant video coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Your name is Aaron. How do you say your last name? Uh, Augustitis. Like, Augustitis. Uh, yeah, that's, that's some vampire Frankie, shit. Frankie, you nailed that. Yeah, that, that is, good. dude. Um, well, we appreciate you hopping on so quick. Basically, we're just we're having it's obviously a Saturday, and we're just kind of just talking until we just don't want to talk anymore. This video, this is coming out on Tuesday for sure. Um, you know. I'm a dead man when it comes to hockey right now, so I don't really want to talk too much to you in regards to your sport because of the New York Islanders. But the Columbus Blue Jackets didn't have the greatest season ever, so we're kind of in the best. <laughs> okay, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. We talked the other day about video coaches and challenging and offsides. And last night we were talking about how um, – we just talked about how 
the Bruins had a hand pass and all this stuff yeah goes on behind the scenes now you are you are a part of that like what is what is this system like what is what is your process like what are you required to be doing during the games how much how much do you do in regards to the video talk to us about all all the aspects of that job right so uh so during the game specifically like so we have this this computer it's called the hawkeye is the the program that it runs on um and it basically like whatever i work on on the computer the coaches then can see it on the bench. So if you you can see the coaches, like when they look down at those monitors on the bench, that's all connected to the computer that is running in our back room. Uh, so there's two of yeah, us. They got those monitors coaches. like in the floor, right? Yeah. So there's most rinks they're in the floor. Some of them, they kind of like tuck them on the corner of the bench. Um, but that's all connected to the computer that I'm running in the back, like in our locker room or, you know, coaches room, whatever building we're in. Um, so I'm just checking everything as the game is going on, right? So offsides are easy to check, like puck enters the zone. You know, you're checking it. You know, if it's blatantly obvious that it's onside, you're not going to you know, waste time checking that. Uh, for the most part, though, it's just like basically watching the play, like a couple seconds behind, and trying to, you know, make marks on if something you know is close to whether it's high stick, hand pass, things like that. Um, more so for like the one, like the with the Bruins one, right? Like I didn't see what angles they had in the room at the time but that's typically like a tv angle that you don't get uh in the moment right so you have to wait for a replay to come from the tv booth to then get that exact angle because if it's on that normal camera angle with the, you can't see that he touches that puck but then when you look at it the other way like you're like okay obviously hits his glove and goes to him so you're using you're using as much time before a goal happens to like you know, be ready for it because you only have that 20, 30 seconds after that on a play like that. Like you have to really lock in on what exactly what time you want to look at something. So are now you when guys you in find communication, something, are you guys in communication with the coach where like the other night where there was an onside offsides and they took back a Carolina goal because they went back and they said, oh, that was actually offsides. Are you in communication with the coach where you say, hey, that goal just happened, but two minutes ago, there was an offsides. Yeah. You guys got to challenge that. Yeah. So, so there's, so I have a radio like, in the locker room. We have one coach on the bench who has an earpiece and a radio. And we have one coach who sits like either, you know, up in the stands or like up in the press box. So all three of us are in co- constant communication. Like there's a close call. Like, you know, the guy upstairs may see it. He's like, you know, check that, check that entry or any one of the coaches on the bench are like, check that entry. So you're constantly checking things like as it's going, but it's three different people that we're all like, involved in it, but I'm the only one that has the control of like the video of it and then showing it to the coaches on the bench to then it, for the, the in offsides ones, black and white, right? Like it's offsides or it's not. So like, those are the ones you're just telling them, Hey, this is offsides. We're challenging it. The ones where it becomes closer are like the goal interference ones where, you know, you kind of want to have a conversation with the other two guys and what do they see on it? Because I may see one thing and they may see one thing. Well, if we both see two different things, odds are that we're probably not going to get the call we want because it's so 50-50. So you're trying to get on the same page as everyone, uh, but there's three of us in constant communication throughout the game. Is it you, just uh, like jubilation when you guys get it right? Like, a, like a, <laughs> Are you guys going crazy back there Like when, when you, you call a goalie interference yeah. and like maybe it's your call and you're like, Dude, I'm telling you guys this is goalie the center interference. Ice, <laughs> Like that? You guys like, go bananas? So it, the, the offsides ones, right? Like, you know. So, like, those you, you tend not to, you know, you're just like, okay, like, we knew that was coming back. But the goal interference ones are some of, like, the biggest roller coasters of emotion because <laughs> you never know what they're going to end up calling. And, like, even if you're like, man, like, I, there's no way this could be a goal. Like, sometimes we've had ones where we're like, oh, we have no idea how that they didn't call that back. So when they call back the goal interference once, it's the best feeling. Like just Dude, this like, is I crazy for forever. fans to so hear because awesome. a lot of the biggest moments of these games are decided between you, this guy in the stands, and the coach. Like, like you guys are legitimately <laughs> making a difference on what is called. Like, I would, I would argue, like the some of the biggest moments in the game. Oh. I mean, every time something's called back, it's a monumental moment in the game. I mean, mm-hmm. we had one this year where we had one game in Dallas this year where we had two challenges called back, like. 
And they were, I mean, like within like five or six minutes of gameplay of each other. Oh. And like just some of that, it was like, oh, we just, two goals just came off the board and then we ended up winning the game. <laughs> like things like when moments like that happen, you're like, okay, I kind of have an impact. Otherwise, you know, you just feel you're just, I'm doing my job the same way that any guy on the ice is doing their job and help, helping us win. So that's kind of like the mindset of it all. So it's like everyone's just got to do their job to like help us win a hockey game. Do you give them like, do you ever give, do you give the coach like a percentage on it? Like he, is he like, what's, this goal interference, like, what do we feel? And, and are you, are you yeah. like 50, 50, are you like 75%? We got this. Yeah. It's typically like the 50, 50 or yes or no. Like it's, okay. it, you're never like, eh, like, you know, it's the ones where you're like 50, 50, like, ah, you know, we could, we couldn't. And that's when it becomes more situational, right? Like, you know, if you're down two goals late in a third period, like you're probably going to take a chance on one. But if you have a one goal yeah. lead and you're late in the third period or you got a one goal lead early and you're playing a team like, you know, like Boston, who's got this great power play right now, like you probably don't want to like leave a 50 50 chance. Like it's typically 50 50 and up is when you're going to make the call unless it's like extremely situational within the game. It's electric. It's what a electric. gig that is, dude. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> that that hand pass from last night's game and the Bruins won. That was crazy to me how good the video guys must be because I feel like that wasn't on anybody's radar in real time. Well, so that's the thing, right? So, like, I'm, like, we're, I'm literally watching the play, like, seconds behind. So, like, watching it on the screen, like, seeing if something happened, then look right at the monitor and look again. So, you know, yeah. watching everything twice if you think it is. And then, you know, a lot of what I'm doing during the game isn't, like, as far as, like, the video that, like, we're capturing for ourselves and the coaches, like, it doesn't need to be, like, on at that exact second. Like, I can, like, go back in the game and fix stuff. So, for me, like, my main priority is, is like, watching to see if we're going to challenge a play. Man, that's, that's awesome. a awesome I gig. It. How, that's how, a great if you don't gig. mind me asking, how yeah. old are you? I'm 27. How'd you get into this? Uh, post-college, um, I got an internship with, like, the hockey ops. So, did a, did a year for an internship with the team. Uh, with the Blue Jackets and then did like two years like you know part-time but like you know full-time kind of helping out just like with home games and then the last two seasons uh been downstairs full-time with the coaching staff just keeping it going so sick yeah so you like get them uh outside of the repl replay stuff you get them like packages for going over you know just like yeah x's and o's type videos with players pretty much yeah just like getting getting other team systems down uh our one video coach he does more of like the five on five stuff uh you know four checks neutral zones like d zone coverage like things like that um and then i get the special team stuff ready for our power play and pk coach who are gonna go over it so we all kind of like have our own job but yeah the days leading up to like i typically am working like three four games behind and then just pulling all that video for the coaches and then they all just rip it through it it's amazing how much goes into it it's yeah. absolutely amazing <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean we're watching like we're watching three four games of a team before we play them and then using all like it goes from like 175 video clips to like 100 to like 45 to like 30 and then we show the team like 12 so like That's it all just gets crazy. chopped down like through like meetings and like each person's eye who gets on it Dude, I cannot wait for games now. CBJ when CBJ has a goal call <laughs> back yeah. against I'm the opponent, now. we're gonna go crazy. Is it, you know, it's crazy. It's funny. It's funny is I'm, yeah, from, I'm from Jersey originally, and like we played the Devils like last week of the season. So like all my buddies, like my family, were all at the game, and we challenge. We had a challenge. And we called the goal back, and like they're losing their minds in the stands, and like they're all huge Devils fans, and they're like, "What is wrong with you? Like we just got a goal." Take off. <laughs> this is something uh, to look forward to. For for next season or a hundred percent wow all right aaron this is great uh, i love yeah, it yeah dude well thanks for hopping on that was awesome perfect yeah. insight happy to help out guys love talking thanks, thanks man. man yeah appreciate it that's great what a gig what a funny thing where you take away happiness from the other team that's like that's your job <laughs> that's a cool gig i don't know yeah I, that's like he's obviously he, he probably play, he's played like growing up and he just loves oh, hockey yeah. and like this is how you getting into a sport that you love you're just like i'm gonna be the video guy and i'm gonna try to take calls and goals off the off the board that's pretty cool really yeah. cool i love that. really cool and that's just a lot of work too like oh yeah watching a lot three, of I mean, he work. said it pretty like nonchalant but watching three or four games of a team before they come into town is just 
a lot of watching games. I mean, that's, Fucking that's eyes like have nine hours bleed. worth of watching games. It's like footage. Dude, ima- yeah. Imagine to you're watching like the Arizona Coyotes for fucking four games before just being like, all but right. you probably he probably sees the differences of like you could see Carolina has a ridiculously, ridiculously aggressive penalty kill and like they do something that other teams don't. And he's like highlighting that stuff and showing like this guy goes here when it goes there and you could actually see the difference and we should go here and we should move the puck here it's like it's amazing that's amazing stuff for just a fucking what i should have pitched in my play Mm. oh shit be like you Mm. you guys see the much of this you guys see any of this because your play is great i'm about to we're about to change the world we're about to change your reaction you tweeted out your your play play. you tweeted out your play what you think was close to your play and if that is true that happens all the time that yeah. little chip pass as a guy goes flying in. It's like a little bit. It's sort of my play. It's it's got the spirit of my play in it. Yeah. The guy, because well, like when we yeah. talked about it, the, we were talking face offs, and then it lets the defensemen all get into the zone. What that video of the star, what they did last night, that's more of what I'm talking about. Where it's more of a jumbled mess than it is. All right, we win the face off. Now we set, and mm-hmm. the guy starts to move it, and now that other guy is going full speed. It's more like. Everybody's kind of spread out, but we need one guy going full tail yeah, yeah, down the ice. That happens. Yeah. A lot. yeah, yeah. Seeing it and seeing you say like that's what I was thinking made me think like yeah that 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 does work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, you were on it. You were on it, Trent. Yeah, no, and I also should say that you know I don't watch hockey, so it sounds like that's a play that exists, but I think I made it up. So going forward, that's going to be my play. We'll give it to yeah, you. I, I can't wait it. for Columbus to call goals back next year. The very that's excited cool. For I that. like that guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm, me too. Uh, all right. That was a fun little Tuesday slash Saturday show. We'll be back um, on Thursday. You want to do for the cut? Second oh show of the God, week. Yeah, we got to do for the cut. I picked Taylor Pendrith. Did you pick him last week? I think so. <laughs> okay. That's I all pick right. Tyrrell no, Hatton. Cut. He's I playing well. I picked Tyrrell Hatton at the, oh, oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming mm-hmm, down mm-hmm, the street. Mm-hmm. Oh, please let it be for me. I'm picking Doug Gim. Ooh. Nice. Dougie. Who did Dan Rapp pick? He picked Wyndham Clark. Okay. Very nice. Good looking guy. I, picked, I also am having a um uh I have a good gambling week with the Kirk show this week. I had two hits right out of the gate. I had Taylor Pendrith to win a matchup and uh Mark Hubbard to win a matchup on their Thursday rounds. Uh and they both won. So right away I got two wins. And then I took a a Tony Finau Patrick Rogers boosted one of those two to win the tournament at plus 550, I think it was. And Tony Finau currently has a two shot lead in the tournament. Look at this. Ooh, I know. Look at this. I know. I know. Some good picks there from, from that show. So, yeah, we're looking okay this week. Um, all right. For the, uh, for the cut, make sure you check that puppy out. We'll get that out on social so you see all the, uh, so you see the odds. It's <clears throat> bet with Barstool. It might be more bets with Barstool. And then it'll be up there. But uh, Taylor Pendrith, Wyndham Clark, Tyrrell Hatton, Doug Gim, all to make the cut. We'll be back on Thursday. Real quick, I want to give a shout out to um, Colonial Springs Golf Club, our place. They are having their U.S. Open qualifier on Monday. So good luck to all the people that are playing at Colonial Springs. I'd like to go over there and just kind of check out like what's going on. Maybe I'll stop by, see like how people are feeling. Tea times start at 7 a.m. I think I'm going to go check it out. I love um, that. That's a tough golf course to play your fucking your your uh, qualifier. Yeah, at. you play Pines Valley Oof. combo from the Golds. I think it's like seventy four point five one forty four, something like ridiculous Oof. like that, like close to Beth Page Black rating and slope. So, um, really ridiculous golf course. So tight, can lose every ball left, and um, the greens are running insanely, insanely firm and fast right now. So good luck to everybody. God, I mean, I think they said last year when they did it, like, what was it? Like around par was like a really good score. Like two under was like getting in. It was nuts. So um, shout out to I, Dan. I'm, I'm ex- yeah, shout out to Dan getting that place and Gene getting that place dialed in. Fuck, man. U.S. Open qualifier at Colonial. Let's go. Let's Hit go. It hard. All right. We'll be Hit back on Thursday. Hit it hard. I got to tell you, I had a few people over to the place uh, last night, and they tried the Truly Vodka Seltzers for the first time. Blown away. Blown away. They're raving about them. We went to a bar afterwards for a little nightcap. They didn't have them there. 
people were devastated, upset because the new Truly Vodka Seltzers, they're game-changing, they're revolutionary. We love the Truly before, over 30 flavors, under 100 cow. The whole deal is great. Now, they're just somehow have made Truly even better. They're fantastic tr- beverages. I've got them downstairs in the refrigerator. Um, there was a game changer for me. I, I loved the hard seltzers. Obviously, the OG Trulies. We were drinking them for the first four or five years of the classic. Um, and now with the with the true real vodka, real fruit juice, all of that stuff, it's a huge game changer. It's really, really um, changed the way that I enjoy Trulies. I can I can drink way more of them and enjoy a lot uh, enjoy them way more than I ever did. They got fewer calories. All 12-ounce cans have under 110 calories, which means plenty of refreshing flavor will not weigh you down. Low sugar. Every Truly Vodka Seltzer contains only two grams of sugar. A refreshing go-to that's perfect for the springtime. They're refreshing. You're going to enjoy it. You're outside. You have a great time. Find out where you can get the vodka seltzers from Truly near you at trulyhardseltzer.com. Again, go find Truly Vodka Seltzer near you at trulyhardseltzer.com. Uh, we are here with Mike Sweeney. Mike Sweeney, Michael Sweeney, whatever you prefer, Dan. I'm I'm good with either. Uh, let's go. Let's go with Mike. Mike Sweeney. Perfect. Um, you might not have heard of Mike Sweeney if you are a golf Twitter perv like us on this show. We live in this bubble. Um, this story has been told a few times by a few different outlets, but I'm told that not everyone uh, eats, breathes, and sleeps golf like we do. So I'm I'm excited to bring it to the four play audience. Um. Before we start, I do want to give credit to Ryan French, also known as Monday Q Info, because um, if you guys don't follow him already, you need to go and do that. Uh, he was with the Fire Pit Collective. I believe now he's working independently. And, and this is what he loves to do is find these stories that you won't find anywhere else because he's the one digging through the mini tours, digging through the qualifiers. So shout out to Ryan French and shout out to Monday Q Info. So Mike Sweeney has quite the story. He played in this last week's uh corn fairy tour event but the reason that people cared and that it was an interesting story is because you currently don't have a home or is that right yeah my situation now is better than it was last year last year 2022 was kind of when i was living out of my car for a good three or four month stretch um i still don't really have a home but like i have places to stay which is nice (laughs) Okay, so we had a, an, a foreplay first, at least in my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, we record on Riverside on this app, and I told my, you know Mike was asking if I needed to download any if he needs to download anything or anything like that in, before the interview. And I said, yeah, as long as you have a computer, you're fine. He goes, I don't have a computer, yeah, no. <laughs> so I've never had that. And our last guest was literally world number one, John Rom. So we give you the full gambit here on the Foreplay Podcast. Awesome. So. Let's let's get into your story. Um, so tell me just a quick rundown of of kind of the jobs and your path between high school and moving to Florida in 2018. Yeah. So um, while like my senior year of high school, I started working at this equestrian farm. One of my friends was working some weekends there, and he's like, "Hey, they're looking for some extra help." And I didn't have a job. I was like, "Sure." So um, I ended up working there for about probably three years up until maybe like six to eight months before I moved. What does working at an equestrian farm look like? Um, <laughs> mowing grass, cleaning stalls, bringing horses out to the paddocks, uh, giving them hay, just whatever, whatever you guys are probably thinking. That's probably exactly what I was doing. I was thinking a lot of like big piles of horse shit. There's definitely a lot of that sitting around for sure. Yeah. I've uh, definitely okay. had my so, fair share. So you're working at, you're working at the equestrian place and then what? Uh, I started working at a bowling alley as well. Um, around the same time I went to community college for one semester wasn't my thing um we'll just say that and then so I started working those two jobs um I used to bowl a lot back in Connecticut um because we had winter obviously so couldn't play golf year round so I needed something to do in the winter but basically did those two jobs just about up until I moved so you moved to Florida in 2018 and you turned professional yeah what was your game like at that time and and what is what did that look like oh game was really bad um (laughs) Like probably like if, if I could put it up against like a strokes gain statistic, like against the PGA tour, I mean, I'd probably be last in the field in every category when I first turned pro. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, it didn't, it wasn't fun to watch. It wasn't fun. Like in Connecticut, like, you know, you can shoot even par, you think you're pretty good. And then you get to Florida against people who play golf year round. And you're like, wow, I'm, I'm terrible. You know what I mean? So um, I knew I had a lot of work to do and um, 
the summer of 2019, about six months after I moved here is when I really got to work with my coach, uh, Billy Orr, who I'm actually sitting outside his indoor facility right now. So I want to hear about the deal that you had with your dad. Yeah. Um, so I don't know the exact time in 2018. It might've been like February, March, April. If she's like, Hey, would you want to move to Florida? I was like, absolutely. And then as we got closer to us going, we came, like he told me the deal was like, I could stay in their house. My dad and his girlfriend, Linda, um, I could stay in their house until I turned 25. And I said, you know, I got, I was 22 at the time. So I was like, that's, let's do it. Absolutely. And then what happened? So you, you go up to New York. I'm, I'm, this is all drawing yeah, from the it. Monday queue. So you go, you go back. Yeah, w- walk us through that, that timeline. You go back to New York and then you come back to Florida. Yeah. I took an assistant pro job in New York because they offered me free housing and free food and a job. So I was like, I could probably save up some money for the next winter when I come down here. And, um, as you might expect, I didn't end up saving as much money as I wanted to because I played a lot of tournaments that summer, like New York State Open, Met Open, traveling around hotels, stuff like that. So, I mean, I had a little bit of money and then I got back down here and um, I stayed with my dad for a couple of weeks just because I was playing a couple of tournaments. And then after that, he was like, hey, where are you going to live? What have you figured out? I was like, ah, I haven't really figured anything out. Probably just going to stay in my car for a little bit because, I mean, as you probably read in the story, I kind of had this whole like, I could pay for golf. I could pay for a place to live. Couldn't really afford to do both. So I'm like, just put the money in golf. And um, obviously we're here now. Obviously it was the right decision. So, Right. And this is, this is kind of what I wanted to get into because, you know, we talk to guys at the, the highest level of professional golf who they don't even check their bank accounts because yeah. winning $3.6 million or whatever it is yeah. doesn't really mean all that much to them. You know, a guy like John Rahm, I was looking at the stats and and he's already 12th in PJ Tour career earning. I mean, these guys are playing for an unbelievable amount of money now. You're on the very, very opposite end of that spectrum. Yeah. Why, why keep going? I mean, there's got, there are people who are going to think about this and be like, why don't just get a job? Like, why don't you just go get a job? And so, yeah. you know what I mean? But what is there is something about this game that just bites you. Yeah, I mean, you definitely you definitely have to love it if you're going to do what I'm doing right now and do what a lot of us are doing. Like, if you just like slightly enjoy it, but it's not really your passion, like it's it's not for you. Like you have to genuinely love and enjoy this game with all of your heart to keep doing what we're doing here. So what what is it what does it look like like what so you you qualified for the tournament in pretty dramatic fashion take us through that that process and then finding a hotel like yeah because you know, the corn ferry the corn ferry tour is not five star hotels and and rental houses for the week yeah um so just just to kind of preface this i i went to the monday qualifier i had twelve hundred dollars in my bank account that's the amount of money i had total total savings check i had twelve hundred dollars so um, contrary to what the stories have written, it only cost me 300 to play the Monday because I have Canada status. So I get to save an extra 200 bucks as opposed to the normal five. Beautiful. Nice work. So, um, I had $1,200 when I went to the Monday, I drove up there with my friend, Peter Bradbeer. Cause like I told you, um, well, not you, I told Kyle that, uh, my car actually, uh, broke down a couple weeks ago. So I haven't had a car. I'm actually sitting in my dad's car right now. Um, so I drove up there with my friend, Peter Bradbeer. And uh, we split a hotel room for two nights, played a practice round, and then uh, obviously we made it through the Monday. So, and then you made a a hole in one. Yeah, in the tournament. For my fourth hole of the tournament. Yeah, I birdied ten, made two pars, and then just genuinely just slam dunked a four iron. I think the number was like two twenty seven or something like that. Did you just think at that point, like, I mean, things are just going, this is like fairy, fairy tale stuff. Did you, I know Ryan was like blowing his load. He tweeted like Sweeney's near the lead. It's like, bro, it's Thursday morning. Um, you ended up missing the cut, but yeah. was it hard to get your emotions kind of in check after like such a, you know, you make it through, you get your first start in a corn fairy tour event and then you ace the fourth hole. It's hard not to think that someone's tapped you on the shoulder. Yeah. I mean, I've always just kind of been take everything as it comes and just kind of stay in the moment relaxed. Like I've always feel like I've been very good at that regardless of what my scenario is. So like, I wasn't really freaking out. Like my friend in the crowd was all the crowd was freaking out and everyone's like, Oh, what does he do? I'm just like, I just went to the next tee shot. I was like, all right, let's get this in the fairway and keep it moving here. You know what I mean? So I mean, yeah, you don't want to get ahead of yourself. I was like, I got a lot of played enough tournaments to know. Yeah, exactly. So what does your schedule look like? Like what, what are the next couple of weeks look like? Um, so originally that was going to be my last Monday qualifier for the corn Ferry, Right. Cause you, you played a few, quite a few. Yeah. Um, cause I have full Canada status, which I think the first tournament starts June 12th. Um, so I was just going to play a couple of mini tour events. Actually three days from now I have us open local qualifying over in uh, Fort Myers. I'm going to go play that this week. 
Um, but it looks like I'm going to be able to make it to the Monday qualifier in Missouri on the 15th due to some uh, some good fortune and assistance I received from this week. So Right. So let's talk about that assistance. So, you know, Ryan ended his story saying that you didn't have much money in your bank account. Yeah. Your dad is your dad pay for your hotel. Is that right? As soon as I Monday, my dad, my dad's been on a cruise the last two weeks. That's the only reason I have his car. Um, So, yeah, he's like he's like messaging me through WhatsApp. He's like, hey, just like use my credit card, get a hotel, just like do what you need to do for the week. It'll be okay. I was like, all right, thank you. (laughs) How was the hotel? I thought it was fine because it's what I'm used to. Um. I was told that people on Twitter thought it was the biggest piece of garbage you could possibly stay in, but are we talking like bed bugs and I mean apparently that's what the review said. I I thought it was perfectly functional. Like I thought you, it was You okay. escaped you escaped scape, you know, no not a single bite on your body. Yeah, I'm functioning. So, you know, Ryan posts online that you're not doing great when it comes to finances. Yeah. You you know, you couldn't you couldn't afford a hotel, your dad has to pay. And then there's this amazing outreach of support from this community of golfers online that Ryan has really tapped into his audience that they just love supporting golfers. And so what happened? Uh, Ryan asked me if it was okay to put my Venmo up there. And I was like, I mean, I wasn't really in a position to say no. So, (laughs) um, and yeah, I mean, I I think even right now, I think there's still some people Venmoing me every on and off every now and then, obviously it slowed down a bunch, but, um, how much money did you get Venmo to you? probably shouldn't say that but i mean it's definitely a lot more than i thought i was gonna get and um come on five figure four figures five figures i mean <laughs> it's uh it's, there's no shame yeah, in it i mean what do you mean it's, an, People, it's enough that i should be good for the whole canada season i mean that's that's unbelievable yeah it's, it's These, you, you basically crowdfunded travel for a whole year of your life like what what does that money mean for you as far as your stress levels and your ability to chase your dream yeah, I'm still not 100% sure if it's actually like sunk in completely yet that I'm not going to really have to worry over the summer or struggle. Like, I don't think I've ever had more than $7,000 in my bank account. And that's strictly because I finished fifth at the Mass Open and got a check for $5,500. Um, so I'm not really sure how to handle it and deal with it yet. But I mean, it just, it's, it's awesome because I mean, I've been talking to my family and they're all getting ready to try to chip in to at least get me funded for my first five events, which I'm guaranteed starts in. So this is nice that I'm not going to have to, you know, reach out to them and have them put their heart and money towards my dream. You know what I mean? So that's, that's awesome. And right. You didn't play college golf. So, you know, and you said you didn't really, you didn't really start improving and getting better until pretty recently. Do you feel like you're still, is there still room to grow? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. What parts, what parts of your game do you feel like you can, you can improve? Uh, based on the stats from last week, I guess the putting has got to get better. I, I lost like two and a half shots, strokes gained putting on the, each round, uh, first and second round. So, I mean, there's the five shots right there that I missed the cut by just in putting. So, let alone two doubles and a triple that I made. So, um, that's actually what I, I came here to work with my coach. We, we got me on Sam Putt Lab. We're taking a look at everything I got going on right now, trying to figure out what the move is. So, Oh, dude, you're big time now. You got you got the money. You got Sam Putt Lab. I mean, you're just my coach you're living Sam like Putt a PGA Lab. Tour pro. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So where so you staying with friends? Where are you where are you sleeping in like these days? Yes, basically um, friends' couches for the most part. Um, I'm probably gonna end up staying with my dad for the last couple weeks until I leave to Canada. But uh, at the moment, like I'll be sleeping on an air mattress in my uh, my friend Taylor's living room tonight. So. Shout out to Taylor. Yeah, shout out to Taylor. And and dis- despite how hard this is, right? You're sleeping in motels where it feels like there's bed bugs, <laughs> or people say there's bed bugs. Right. You're you're trying to scrape together cash to pay an entry fee. Mm-hmm. You seem like a really happy guy, and and I'm just you know, would you? I guess you'd rather be doing this than than like a real job. Yeah, because I mean, like we said, when I first moved to Florida in the article, I worked at Subway for like a year and a half, a year, a little under two years, and it's just like that was just the most brutal thing of all time. Like I absolutely hated everything about that. So, I mean, the fact that I work a couple days at a golf course out in the car barn and then I get to play golf, regardless of what my bank account looks like, like you can't really be upset with that. And I guess the, the sort of carrot at the end of the tunnel, or, you know, the, the potential prize of getting on the PGA tour and how much money there is like, do you, do you see that and, and, and draw inspiration from that? Yeah, see, I've I've, really, I've never really felt like the money was the driving factor. It's just like I just really like winning golf tournaments, and I really like having success. Like, there's no better feeling to me in the world than just like going to a golf tournament and knowing you were the best player at the tournament that day. Like, there's a certain feeling and like confidence and happiness that comes with that. 
and obviously like the money's great. Yeah, the you feel like cool, you're but... like swinging your dick around there. Yeah, you're exactly, like, I'm a yeah. fucking man. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's more just like I like I said, the love for the game and just like the desire to want to be better. And cause there's always room to improve. Nobody ever perfects golf, so there's always little things you can do to get better. And I think just that that desire is kind of what just makes me want to get there. Yeah. Well, you've had a smile on your face for this entire interview, which I think is pretty remarkable given your circumstances, though I suppose you probably feel like a rich man now with some money in your bank account. Um, not quite. <laughs> no, nah, I'm still, I'm no, still but, salty. Uh, I missed the cut. I'm not going to lie to you. but <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's a true golfer's mentality. Yeah. Well, we'll be rooting for you on the uh, on the Canadian tour this year. And um, Thank you. You know, I'm really happy for you that, that you know, the, the community reached out and supported you. And now you have some runway. So. Now you have runway, you got to run with it. Now you got to play well to justify those, uh, justify their investments. We won't call them donations. We'll call them investments. I like that, 100%. Yeah, and then I guess like when you, when you win your first PJ Tour event, you can pay those people back. Absolutely. Does that work? That works great for me, Dan. Perfect. All right, thanks, Mike. We appreciate it, pal. Thank you. 